hey man, I miss you. It's so good to hear your voice and see you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks. It's always fun hearing from you because I know that you're up to some adventure on some other part of the world and it looks like that's truth for today. Uh -huh. Where are you now? Right now I'm in northern Vietnam in a little farming area. Wow. And the town here was just a village. Wow. For thousands of years probably. And then wow. when the internet opened up tourism, it suddenly became a thriving little metropolis. It's really tiny. There's only 80,000 people in the town. Wow. I mean, that's not super tiny. It was a village and now it's 80,000 people with giant hotels. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's amazing. So what brought you out there to Northern Vietnam? Um, I wanted to do writing projects and then I kind of got sidetracked by my fascination with the whole COVID-19 thing. Wow. Did you come out there before or after COVID? I arrived right in the beginning of it. I was in Myanmar for a month. Okay. And then I arrived here on February 24th. Wow. And the real hysteria hit social media about the 9th okay. of March. So I'd been here about 10 days before all of a sudden it was like, bam, we all got smacked in the face with, with the COVID-19 thing. <laughs> and are you kind of stuck there or have you been stuck there? You can't probably, couldn't travel for a while, yeah? I'm pretty sure I'm stuck here, but I haven't looked into it. I just kind of, <laughs> I couldn't yeah. find a plane ticket, so. And you, but you're happy. You're like enjoying exploring. Oh, it. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It was That's interesting cute. to see how everyone just fell into line. It was like very self-organizing. Everybody just knew the drill somehow. And everybody wow. said, okay, this is actually happening. Everybody wear a mask. Now everybody stay home. Yeah. Don't ask any questions. Just do it. And everybody just did it. And then a month later, no more masks, zero deaths. And everybody's going about their business like wow, economic well, you know how different that is from America's story, right? <laughs> right. I can't imagine really because I can't distinguish between the click, the headlines and, yeah. uh, and what's actually happening. Over yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. I mean, the headlines are telling a much more dismal story than what we've pretty much felt in the public daily discourse here and the, the daily lives of us. I mean, it's like, sure that everybody's at home for the most part and it's been a super ghost town city of portland but now two a little over two months later people are just slowly getting back out there and it's picking back up it's definitely not as busy as it used to be but it's not it's not like dead you know so but the the headlines are still making it seem like this horrible situation with all these people dying and that's like well it's not quite what we're experiencing <laughs> right right <laughs> so, so how, oh go ahead is, is everyone allowed to just go about their day freely again or is it still considered quarantine okay so the stay at home is kind of still like encouraged and like only if essential trips are necessary that's kind of still like the government's motto but what we're seeing more and more of is people ignoring that and kind of going out more and more um there are certain businesses that we're in like a phased reopening so like i think we're now in phase two phase one was just like a certain you know few more than essentials could open and now in phase two we're getting to the point where like some restaurants are back to normal like and i think it's more the ones on the outer lying rural counties um they're like letting dining in happening and then as phase three and phase four happen it'll get closer to the urban centers and because i think they're trying to avoid the like the urban centers doing too much at once right and it makes sense that the more rural areas are kind of more of an experimental area <laughs> not many yeah. not, not as many people get hurt <laughs> Yeah, but hey, are you 
um, <clears throat> are you able to deal with the language barrier over there? Or was that kind of a hard thing since you kind of got stuck there? I bet you're having to learn some Vietnamese. It's hard to learn Vietnamese because people don't just speak. Mm. They don't say anything at all or they try to speak English. Oh, so, interesting. They're too courteous. Yeah, yeah, they're just way too nice. It's <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, you wouldn't understand me. Uh, let me try to talk some English or anyway. we could just use the learn universal language of hand signals. <laughs> yes. <Is> that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it's been going so yes like language barrier yeah but i have been meeting a lot of people that do speak english and strangely enough even here in this smaller town and now i've moved to a village outside of that town of oh, eighty thousand. Wow. yeah and it's all hill tribe like wow. natives wow but the internet opened up tourism so they all invited western or or foreigners into their homes for the past five years so wow. even some of them speak english pretty well oh that's perfect yeah that's great so are you doing some farming with them or what what's the lifestyle they're like i haven't this they're planting rice right now because covid19 kind of eliminated any potential for tourism so they all just went back to the rice fields which is kind of wow. cute and they probably saved up money. They built themselves up nice houses, and they're there's back to back to their primordial normal. That sounds very That's nice. Kind of nice. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool to see. I mean, like we're a lot of. I just did a podcast yesterday with my friend Ben, so you could see this episode too now on the Sacred Rebel. And the whole topic was my friend Ben had made a comment that he thought COVID-19 was going to cause a massive back to the land rush. And so yeah, I'm like, uh, Ben, let's talk to th about that. And here you are saying that's exactly what they're doing in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. And in Vietnam, of course, it's more, it's, they're, they're not, it's all extended family. It's not community, so to speak. It's okay. just familial, like they did a, a hundreds and hundreds of years ago. I love it. And it's not necessarily eco-friendly. Like they might put chemicals on the rice. They might kick their dogs and throw trash on the ground, which isn't really what the back to the earth vision is, but, right. but it's similar. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I think they might, they might even eat their dogs. <laughs> oh, geez. you know, that's actually reminding me of the Amish. Who for, for yeah. before, before I really met the Amish and got to know them, you know, I idolized them, and then it ended right. up being very similar. Like they they don't treat their animals with much respect. They don't treat their women with much respect. Right, right. Blah blah blah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they do live on the land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's good and not to idealize. We have to distinguish between the Amish and the Quakers. The Quakers, I think, are a little bit more conscientious of on a more broad scale that's true and then but, yeah. um there's another one gosh the there's the um not the shakers but the um anyways yeah there's a bunch of different yeah. people that live simply like that and have their own religions and yeah yeah the shakers yeah. was one shakers was one example. yeah 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 cool yeah there's the quakers the shakers the amish and then there's even one more the mennonites mennonites german yeah. baptists yeah. And I don't remember what exactly they were calling themselves, but even Harriet Tubman lived at a hippie commune, I suppose. Right. But on. it was a hundred <laughs> years before hippies. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't know that about Harriet Tubman. Constance, Paul just said that Harriet Tubman lived in a hippie commune before hippie communes were a thing. <laughs> it was like a hundred years ago, but <laughs> yeah. she can't hear you, so I had to tell her that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, she's walking yeah. by. So, um, hey, Paul, I just want to introduce people to you a little bit. It's now like 10 minutes into the interview. So I might chop this out and put it at the beginning. But um, mm. I, I, okay. wanted, I wanted to let us flow for a little bit there. But um, hey, this is, this is a great opportunity to just share a little bit about who you are and what you mean to me. And that might lead us into some interesting conversation. Sure. Okay, cool. 
Well, Paul, you and I met on Kauai at Stellar Gardens, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, the other thing that we were connected to was Common Grounds. And right. we both mutually knew people there. And then, you know, just Kauai being Kauai, we had a lot of friends in common, similar, similar activities we were involved in. So I think we kind of got to know each other more after seeing each other around kind of thing, right? Right. And we, you were, um, you were, all, you were interested in Tibetan Buddhism. You were meditating, um, doing that. You were very passionate and knowledgeable and connected to the sustainable communities movement, which as you can see here, I got my poster from our movie that nice. within reach movie that I did. And, um, you also, um, practice, uh, you know, you did a lot of farming and you knew, you knew your plants. I think we also at one point connected through the community gardens project, uh, that was near common ground. Yeah. Yeah. So we just have like a lot in common, kind of very similar mind, mind, mind thoughts and processes and experiences. But the one thing about you that you mean a lot to me about is you've, you kind of gone on this journey, this personal journey towards, um, that I really appreciate about you, Paul, of kind of trying to figure out the sustainable community world and where like like balancing the the realism of where the world's at with like how can we make this sustainable community vision happen and you have a great approach to it with like systems thinking and um econ like real economics thinking and um you know deeper deeper dives into approaches of you know ways in which communities have failed in the past that we can rectify them with in the future with some actual practical solutions it seems like yeah. is that that kind of, of of an accurate depiction of things that you've been working on a lot yeah well i think i in dharma and tibetan buddhism we talk about dharma as being immutable it's not like a theory it's not like an idea or a possibility it's the way the universe works and anybody who wants to explore it can find that out for themselves and everyone seems to come to the same general agreement. And I felt like there must be some immutable foundation to economics as well. So I dove in to figure out what that was. And I discovered Henry George along the way. And I think he'll, that his ideas will be the foundation for the global economy eventually. Henry George. Really, Henry George. I'm going to Google this guy right now. Progress and Poverty is the name of his book. Oh, wow. The subheading is The Remedy. Got and it. Leo, Leo Tolstoy, I'll paraphrase, Leo Tolstoy says something about, like, you. we don't argue with the ideas of Henry George. If we, if, if we really get to know them, we can't help but agree. <gasps> Ooh, what a quote. That's great. Well, and that, let me just say to you too, that speaks to the spirit of this podcast right there. Um, Sacred Rebel is not about being a rebel without a cause. It's right. being a rebel with a sacred cause. Right. And you are that kind of person to me for sure. And um, I love how you're you always back up what you say with research or some book or some person who said something. This is great. I mean, you've dove in right into where I knew you would go. And what, what I love about you, too, is that it's always really well thought out, the, the way that you point me towards topics and, and resources, because, for example, my, my, my mind is constantly working with more esoteric things like, does alien life exist? Is there a secret space program? If there is free right. energy, why don't we have it? Like stuff like yeah. that. And so I'm, I'm one of the things I'm going to be doing in this podcast is sharing my research and the years of coincidences and common, common conclusions people have drawn from different sources and, you know, real life personal examples I've had with some of this stuff. And, but at the same time, I want to hear other people's perspectives and even their their own experiences and what makes them tick. But the basis of this podcast is not about just what's in my crazy mind, but what's in all of our crazy minds, especially yeah. those of us who are sacred rebels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's, that was, that's a great launching pad. 
So quick question. Are you t thinking about writing books about this topic? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like all of the writing that I do and I want to start blogging like every day, but I, I haven't yet. Um, I want to share just what's immutable, just the ideas that, that I can't find any other alternative to that a thousand years from now should still be true where Beautiful. we come up with many different stories and they change over time. Yeah. Charles Eisenstein recently was talking about how cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease anymore, even though for the past 30 years, everybody just knew that's the way it was, but now that's not the way it is anymore. Wow. So everything can change yeah. except for some things. And it's those things that I want to write about. I call those subjects, timeless subjects. Yes. Timeless ones love that i especially like that term when it comes to art i make video for a living and um a lot of my colleagues in the video industry we refer to making timeless imagery because you know a lot of video creators can get caught up in what's new and hip and what looks trendy and cool but it's like is that going to be really dorky in a year from now <laughs> yes yes exactly you know <laughs> So yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, and I wanted to say too about your comments about the um, immutability of Henry George and what Tolstoy said about him. That's kind of how I feel about this podcast too, in the sense that I want to share things personally and I want to hear from you personally too about things that, you know, we, you, us as sacred rebels feel like, okay, I really deeply resonate with this with this. Why is this something people are arguing with? And why is this a topic that's oppressed and why is this not being talked about you know right. those are the kinds of things i feel like i'm getting to the point now at this time in history and especially because of covid that i can't stop myself from needing to express them and i'm at the point now where i just don't care anymore and i'm going to express them <laughs> right, right you know but i want to do it in a way where i'm not pushing on other people i want them to just like you said just allow them to come to it yeah. And so a podcast is great because they can, if they don't like this, they can turn it off. <laughs> sure. Book's great too. Like they just close the book and move on. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I think Guru Padma Sambhava or Lon Shimpa maybe was suggesting that there's certain ways that you can share the Dharma. Like mm. we don't just go to a cocktail party and run our mouths, but if we write a book, then that's a, a good way to do it if we get receive a terma and create a practice in that way, then that's a good way to do it. And yeah. maybe he would say podcast is also a good way to do it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. For podcast. <laughs> well, I hope to, to read one of your books someday soon. And in the meantime, let us, let me know what your blog is and I'll put it in your show, show notes when that time comes. Okay. Cool. Cause yeah, I love your thought processes, Paul. And on that note, why don't you, why don't you give us a little bit more of an insight onto kind of the topics that you're going to be discussing more in your books and your podcasts or your blogs. Um, Maybe a teaser if you want to tease us. Sure. <laughs> I feel like it's, it, it's really difficult to visualize what society is. Mm. And even if we shrink society down to a small farm in the countryside and call it a, a, a community, it's still really, really complex to visualize that people jump right into, oh, yeah, we could build a cob house over there, or we could do composting toilets, and we can plant some mustard greens in the garden. Th th those sort of things are so easy for us because they're tangible. But then when we start talking about taxation and economics and and social architectures like how does marriage work how do, how do we understand a transcendent form of relations that are sexual or when there's children involved like people having kids together and then splitting up and how all of that stuff starts to get really messy sometimes so in the book i'll have the system divided into seven categories and the first one is the the gardening in the the earth that's ironic because just let me step in here Go ben ahead. and i mentioned this in our podcast but i feel like the first thing people have done on their own with no societal pressure 
since COVID happened is we kind of started our COVID gardens. Right, right. Have you, have you, I mean, it's like victory gardens have just sprouted up everywhere and we're kind of noticing it's all because of COVID. And like, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the people that I know who are gardening now weren't gardening before. It's oh, like, nice. wow, this is really, really exciting. And I would say a majority of them have that conscious mindset that that's important. But I think like even my sister and her brother, because I had all this time, they started planning things and they're like normally way too busy to garden or even think about that as being important. Yeah, so, nice. Interesting that you think the first thing to talk about is gardening and that's actually literally what's happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you're on to something. <laughs> people, people have more time on their hands for sure. Yeah. And more dirt on their hands. Yeah. And people, you know, also another thing that Ben mentioned is he loves seeing everybody working on their houses in the neighborhood. It's true. You just see people fixing things up. There's more like the past two months, I've heard more banging and sawing and chopping in the neighborhood than I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. All day, every day. <laughs> then the second aspect is this uh, social aspect. And okay. Right now, a lot of people are talking about stimulus checks and universal basic income. The healthcare topic is not really big in the media right now but things like that are good to talk about when we're thinking about community and society how do we how does welfare actually work and whose responsibility is it okay so that's been an interesting topic on my mind lately because i've seen you're gonna laugh at this one paul and i'd love to hear your insights so as a small business owner i, I supposedly qualify for all the sba loans small business okay. administration um, yeah. PPP, which is payroll protection program and these, um, stimulus checks and then unemployment and the pandemic unemployment system. So all these things were coming out, right? Um, right. it took forever for us to get our stimulus check. We still haven't got unemployment and we just got news yesterday that our, our SBA loan fell through because of some missing information. So we're like two months into this and I've probably spent literally 20 hours a week if not more on just filling out applications and following up with people, not to mention all the time I've spent, you know, um, researching, joining groups, going to conference calls, all learning how to fill out these SBA loans. I've even like brought in our bookkeeper to help and we're planning to pay her out of uh -huh. the PP, out of the PPP because she is a regular person we pay anyway. So, I mean, it's just like, I feel like we've spent more than part time of our lives for the past eight weeks doing this. And then to hear that it didn't come through was like a total yeah. pivot for me because I was just thinking, you know, Paul, I spent, if I had spent all that time the past two months focused on making my business thrive during this time, I probably yeah. might've made more money than I'm going to end up getting from the government anyways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm just laughing because it's just that thought process of like, do I really want to depend on the government? I mean, I'm a total fan of like universal income. I'm always a fan of welfare programs or anything that helps people who are in, in need and need it and, pro, you know, social programs like that. But at the same time, as an entrepreneur, I'm just like, what a waste of my time personally. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm like in between. I feel like there's somewhere in between that might make it more sustainable for people in our, and our government obviously isn't able to even keep up with it all. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, blockchain projects that are focusing on UBI, but I'm not sure that they're sustainable, really. Okay. Not yeah. ecologically sustainable, but yeah. Yeah. We do can do it ourselves. We just have to be clever. Yeah. And what do you, as far as universal basic income goes, um, my thoughts, and tell me what you think, my thoughts is it'd be a great thing for people that were, are in the phase of life that I was in as a young artist out of school totally out of a job right didn't, didn't have any direction in my life so I freaking rode my bike around the country and camped and farmed for 10 years you know yeah. I, that's the kind of time that's the kind of time in my life where UBI would have been perfect and I encourage people all the time to get out and go do things like that but people are so afraid about money that they don't right so but at, also then I'm beyond that point now I have a wife and a kid and 
you know, a UBI probably wouldn't support our needs. So I'm happy with other people getting that money. And do you think that that's how it would end up being sustainable? Because it would only be a certain percentage of the population really utilizing that money? I that think you- everyone should get a check no matter how oh, wow. rich you are. Interesting. Okay. But it, cool. It can be sustainable from a federal, national, nation state level. Yeah. But the nation state model, we're outgrowing it. I think we're moving okay. to decentralized in the next 20 years or so. Wow. Over the next 20 years. So when I said unsustainable, I was thinking about the smaller projects. They okay. don't have a taxation system to feed the UBI, and it's purely based on speculation. Yeah. People trading these tokens, cryptocurrency tokens. So do you think that UBI is going to be only possible through a digital currency like this? Well, if we do it ourselves, I think Yeah. Yeah. I think that can be really helpful, yeah. Okay. Decentralizing it is the way to do it. I see where your point is. And do you yeah, think yeah. that the universal basic income if it was decentralized that through something like B- um, Bitcoin or whatever, then it's a it's a not only universal but earthwide. Yeah, it would be a global, and there oh. could be millions of them. It doesn't wow. have to be just one. Okay, so a lot of that's interesting. Ones. Yeah, so like okay, so people in your country where you're at right now, uh, Vietnam, yeah. like if they were on a UBI that I could also be on here, they could go a lot further on it over there. Right. So that, how, how would, the, would the implications of that look? I'm thinking more like if, uh, if, I, if, if there's a bunch of different UBI platforms, then yeah. some of them pay me like six cents per day. And I'm like, I can't live on six cents per day. But if, there's, if I am participating with a hundred different platforms that pay anywhere from six cents to $60 per day, given, and they're always changing, it, it's going to be this crazy dynamic. Wow. Thing. That's amazing. And, and, I love that. that. So the money will be coming from many, many different places. Okay. So here's a dorky question for you, but. Uh, Star Trek. I'm not a, right. like a super knowledgeable about Star Trek, but I love the concept of a lot of the things on that. And in Star Trek, the society that exists on Earth at that time in the future is all um, moneyless. Right. And everybody is able to survive. Do you know more about what the thought process is behind the theories on that? Is that kind of where you're going? Like it would be a like a universal income based economy for everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And it, it probably would have to change its name because UBI is something more specific. Yeah. So people do talk about gift economy Yeah. a lot. And I. it depends on who I'm talking to, but a lot of time people are kind of lofty about it and they just, it's just a dream because they want it so bad. Yeah. I like to ask questions like, yes, I feel like that is something that will happen in the future. And how does China relate to the African nations in a gift economy? I want mm. to know the details. I want to make this real. That's beautiful. So, so, so if we can answer questions like that, yeah. we can make it happen. So let's go back to the money then. And does the money, the UBI with the Bitcoin end up looking something like Star Trek in the sense that ultimately it's a moneyless, it's a moneyless society. Right. Everything yeah. happens automatically. Transactions transact with smart contracts okay. and nobody has to do anything. That's an interesting. And... Wow. But the I people lo- that are not really feeding value to the community, that will be something that everybody can access. Everybody will know that information. It's like, okay, this person is more of a drain. We still support them, but they're draining the system instead of providing value. Right. That's really interesting, Paul. Wow, thank you for sharing all this. Okay, this is beautiful. Okay, so there's a, um, a thought process. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit, but I can't get too into details because I did sign an NDA with this person. Uh, but it's a person that we actually both, I think mutually know on Kauai, but I can't say this person's name. But um, 
this person's um, project for the past couple of years has been based on something similar, but basically it would be an app basically. And it would be tied into a technology of some sort that I really don't understand. Um, but it would basically like maybe be a bracelet or something that would, it would basically um, help understand when you're happy or not. Yeah. And if you're happy, um, you get like coin. Yeah, yeah. And just if you're like not, that. if you're not happy, you just don't get coin. And it would be hers was a based a, a cryptocurrency based idea. Yeah, yeah. That's oh my the god. Of the future. That's yeah, what you're thinking. Real. I love it. Yeah. Do you know? I do. You don't know this person's idea, no. then, do you? Okay. Uh-huh. Um, I shouldn't talk about it publicly, but um, maybe we can get in touch about it offline. Um, but this person's idea too is great because you know it can be tied into products so like let's say you're happy while you're wearing somebody's products they get coin for you being happy while you're using their product right right you know and, and maybe that, they have a coin of their own right they would have a coin of their exactly they would all you everybody would have their own coin actually is what she was saying yeah. ultimately yeah, yeah. like i could invest in paul coin because Paul's doing yeah. pretty good over there. And I see that he's very happy, which by the way, I would totally invest in your coin. And, <laughs> and I would be like, Paul's doing great things for the world. He's over in some village in, in Vietnam and they need help. And I really want to invest in him. You can have your own coin. And people might like really be able to make differences in parts of the world that normally would not see that because now everybody has meaning behind what they're doing. Yeah. That's really cool. I love it. And, it, and like, let's, let's say you want to start a beach cleanup, whatever, it, like people will jump all over that. Cause they're all going to get coin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for doing the beach. If, right. Right. And if somehow there could be a metric for cleaning up the trash, somebody's like, yeah. I picked up 1.2 tons of garbage yeah. in the past three days. Yeah. And they take it to a facility and it gets weighed and then they get the coins for that even though the coins don't have any actual dollar value maybe right. but the social value right and there's you know there's crazy ideas that this sparks for me too i mean she was she so many people will will get this and i think go with this very soon because it's based on for the most part, technology that's already exists. It's just tying it all together in a way that people are like, oh, now I get it. Right, right. right. Is that kind of what you're thinking too? Uh-huh. That's awesome. I mean, like, let's say you you walk into a store, right? And you want to buy something off the shelves. There could be just a something that connects to your bracelet and reads how many coin you have. And like you said, transactionless, you just walk out of the store yeah. with whatever you want, whatever your coins allow you to want yeah that's so cool and i think amazon even has a store like that now did you know that no but i would like to go there and experiment with it that yeah like a it's a it's a it's a i think it's like an experimental store in like seattle and the whole store is connected to your face and then your phone and so every time you go to a different shelf it reads your face and you grab an item off the shelf you have to have this app opened and i right. think and then once you grab something off the shelf, it at, puts it on your app on the phone. And then you walk yeah. out, you walk out of the store and then it take, there's no checkers or anything. And you just walk out of the store and it all comes out of the app, which is connected to your bank account. Amazing. Isn't that cool? Yeah. 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 Now we just <laughs> need to decentralize that idea. Okay. I see what you're saying. I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Cause we don't want it all in the power of one corporation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. Ann Rand would love that idea, but uh, uh, the all in the that, all the all in the power of one corporation is what Ann Rand would like. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. with a corporation. Yes, especially with with Oh man, well, well, that's that's fascinating stuff. So, how realistic do you think it is then that um, there will be a movement after COVID nineteen towards you universal income? Because it, it seems like it's been in the media a lot lately. Yeah. It seems like the, like you said about turning people back to creating a garden, there's all sorts of different things that people are more aware of now that yeah. we'll be able to develop more in the future. 
Yeah. But a lot of things I find people aren't right. I mean, we've been talking about Bitcoin for t 10 years. Yeah. And people are still, then people, uh, ha, they get afraid of something like the Fed coin. We're about to get, I think we're about to get a stimulus. We got the stimulus check or direct deposit. And so in the future, if the bills pass, I think what they're going to do is mail us a, a debit card. That's what I heard. And on the debit card, it's not going to be like our like the money that we use today it's going to be the fed coin it's going to be a cryptocurrency uh, that is tr fully traceable so yeah. it's a great onboarding strategy because people were afraid a lot of people were afraid some people were afraid and other people were just like i don't understand bitcoin so if they can just swipe it like they do their debit cards then it'll be easier for them to adopt it right so it's COVID's kind of paving the way for the gift economy through taking one step backwards because Bitcoin was a huge step forward yeah. and was too daunting for a lot of people. So nobody's yeah. using it. Yeah. So now we're taking one step back and putting the dollar on the blockchain and then we can move forward from there. Once people start using it, they're like, wait a minute. Yeah. Why are we using dollar <laughs> coin when we can use right. Bitcoin, which is decentralized. And that'll quickly come to fruition too, in a, in the sense that I don't know about you, but I think I mean, we just pumped four trillion dollars in the economy. Right. M that was money printed out of thin air, which yeah, is gonna yeah. it's gonna cause problems for the dollar, I think. <laughs> so yes, yeah, yeah there's people will. I actually I'm not even that financially savvy with the the markets and stuff, but we immediately went out and bought silver and gold. Because I was yeah. like, uh, they just pumped $4 trillion out of thin air into the economy. I'm going to go buy some silver and gold because I don't trust my money sitting in a bank account right now being worth anything down the road. You know? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I, I've been surprised that a lot of people aren't talking about that. Like, just getting other things than the dollar right now. Like, I'm surprised that's not a huge topic of conversation. So thank, yeah, you, I thank you for sparking this. <laughs> I mean, I I'm that, I, don't get me wrong. I'm glad the government is helping, trying to help small businesses. Although I do agree with the people that are pissed because, and including me, that they gave a lot of that money to big corporations right off the bat. I'm like, come on. Yeah. That was, that was weird. But uh, I mean, the, the, yeah, that was just weird. Yeah, I'm not an economist and I don't know what all mechanisms are necessary, but uh, I'm sure there's some nepotism happening. Yes. I mean, whenever somebody has a, a death in the family, we see so many times everybody's fighting for this house or that car or give me my inheritance. It should belong to me because I'm the oldest or whatever. Right. It happens. <laughs> it's, it's a part of humanity. It's not necessarily that governments or corporations are eviler it's just that that's what happens yeah so there's economic tools that we can use to lessen the impact of economic collapse and printing money is one of them giving money to corporations is another one of them i just don't know how much underhanded power grabbing is actually happening also I love your realism there. That's really, see, this is what I love about you, Paul. Like as, as open bleeding heart people, we would th think, Oh yeah, the poor should get it. And you're like, yeah, but people are people the, the everybody grabs for money when they have the opportunity to grab for money <laughs> and you're right. That's very realistic yeah. of you. I've yeah. seen it here in, in Southeast Asia where you go to a small hill tribe and everybody is really super poor. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the grass is green it's always raining they're not going to starve to death it doesn't get below freezing they don't have to endure long winters but still they don't have ac adequate transportation and they don't have access to information they don't have cell phones they're starting to have them now but 10 years ago when i was here i noticed i went to a Aka hill tribe and there was one guy in the village that set it up like a, a homestay where westerners could go and it was his thing and he was kind of just like taking over the village and he was making 
tons of money and not sharing it with anyone else. So he would he just had a couple of SUVs and whatever. Like he, <laughs> he had the money, so he just bought SUVs wow. and flat screen TV and whatever else, but didn't take care of everyone else. Oh wow! So I feel like it's just a human trait, right. and our economic system and our social systems don't really have any way to solve the problem of income disparity or class division. So here's that's an, one here's thing. an interesting story for you that might be inspiring for uh, the village like yours too. Um, I've, I, I love that you've visited a village in Northern Vietnam before. That's really cool, by the way. Um, makes me want to travel again. <laughs> Um, there's some places in the world I've been that I'd like to go back to, um, specifically Central America. Have yeah. you ever been to Central America? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I've been, I was in Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. Uh -huh. um, uh, and on that trip, uh, specifically, um, when we went to ha the mountains in Honduras, probably a similar story to the village you're in now. I, how, how big is the little village you're in now? Um, population wise I don't know guessing maybe like 3,000 spread out over a s one square mile oh that's actually bigger than I thought okay wow but over one square mile geez they're packed in there yeah that's really cool are all the houses like really close together yeah oh wow how cool is that and I they're all that. timber frame too like if we were to change the topic <laughs> yeah. really beautiful timber frame building oh look at you wow that's beautiful if okay so most people are gonna be listening to the podcast but i will be posting these to youtube so you can see what he's pointing at right now this is beautiful yeah. it's like it looks like really kind of like hand cut lumber but beautifully cut and it's not painted maybe a little bit of stain on it yeah, it, yeah. there's no nails it's all like wooden pegs no nails wooden pegs it, do they have a local mill I think they just do it all by hand. They cut, they saw the boards by the hand. They cut them with a hand saw. Unbelievable. It's beautiful. So they don't, they're not buying materials. Maybe their metal roof they're buying. The metal roofs, yeah, they buy in the concrete for the okay. floor. But they're not the, buying, they're not buying the wood. They're cutting that themselves. Right. Wow. Up into the mountain and cut the tree. And the walls could be made out of wood or bamboo, depending on how many, how much money people have. Some That's amazing. Wow. Well, okay. This is just mind blowing. Wow. I'm very inspired by what you're showing me right now. That's a beautiful home. Now, is that home that you're staying in like a lodge kind of for a lot of tourist people? Yeah, it was, uh, I think it might be a renovated family home. Okay. And it might have been created from scratch just for tourism. Okay. But it's created by local families and in the same fashion that they always build everything. Wow. So who knows what the future will bring? It might, I, I think, back to the economics conversation. Yeah. I think we're, I think the whole planet. Some places will get hit worse than others, but we're on like a, yeah. a slow motion train wreck for the next five years or so. Interesting. So it's not going to happen in the next three months. It's going to happen in the next three years or more. Wow. The inflation from planting money and the right. lack of jobs and all of that stuff. Right. So I don't think here they're going to have a lot of tourism from outsiders, only Vietnamese tourists. Okay. Okay, so here, go, going back to that human nature story, can I add to that a little bit? I think, yeah. you might, I think you might find this interesting. There was a village that we visited in the hills of Honduras, and the, I think the village had a few neighboring villages, but the specific little concentrated concentration of homes and families that we visited was literally like maybe 100 people, maybe 150. Right. It was right. really, really, really small. Um, and when we went there, um, we'd heard the story about um, th how they were living in a cloud forest and kind of like cutting down all the trees to sell, you know, their heritage land to places like McDonald's to raise cattle on. And um, so yeah. 
these um, Christian missionaries who were environmentally conscious and very um, socially aware and conscious too. Um, this was back in the day when I was studying Christianity and cause you know, I was literally studying it too. I went to school yeah. um, in college uh, not being a Christian and then met some friends that were very dear to me and converted to Christianity and actually became a religious studies minor. Um, not only right. um, studied world religions, but also studying Christianity and, but also at the same time became a environmentalist. So found out about this one group in the world called target earth. And they were the only Christian environmentalist group and they connected with world vision and sent us down to central America to learn from this missionary dude who was just like super cool. He wasn't there to preach Jesus. He was more there to help these villages save themselves by saving the earth. Because what yeah. he was he was noticing that they were killing their future by cutting down their forests, yeah, and their kids' future, and he was like, okay, so how like going back to the like idea that I talked about um, in um, my first episode, like I don't really want this episode or this podcast to be preachy, like or what we were talking about yeah. earlier. I just want it to be there, and if people want to learn, great he was kind of of that same mindset. Like you don't go into a village and tell them, Hey, you need to stop cutting down your trees. Right. But you got to help them understand. So how do you help them understand? So he, he asked some questions and listened and he said, look, I have access to church funds back in the United States. And if I tell the church what you guys need, they will be glad to donate and send money. And so the, the villagers were like, okay, what do we need? Hmm. They discussed among themselves. And so they came back to him and they said, we need lights for our soccer field because we come back from farming out in the hills all day long and we can't play soccer anymore because um, we're too tired. We're too, too, it's too dark when we get home and soccer is what brings us joy. And I was like, that is so fascinating because he offered to them like things like, a a health clinic or a school or water wells or they wanted lights for their soccer field and the electricity to run it (laughs) yeah so what they isn't that brilliant so what he ended up doing is getting the money from the church to to get some generators and they built um gravity fed hydro power to to run these lights and they got the lights for the soccer field and then what happened is once the people had gotten the lights and were starting to enjoy their lives more and playing soccer at night then they were like oh w- what were you saying about a health clinic and uh, what were you saying about a school sure we'll, we'll take that now but yeah it w- yeah wasn't until and so this story of the guy who had the suv and the flat screen tv it's like okay get it out of your system you know get your toys get your things and then when, right, you're, right. when you're ready to get real come back and we'll talk about it <laughs> yeah yeah yes exactly <laughs> yeah People talk of these days a lot about the resource-based economy from um, Jack Fresco's ideas, the Venus okay. Project. Yeah, oh gosh, the Venus Project's amazing. And I'm sure that his ideas, I haven't read them yet, actually, strangely enough. <laughs> Somehow haven't got to that yet. But <laughs> the terminology kind of is strange for me because every economy is resource-based and extracting resources from the planet is part of the problem. So I think he could have come up with a different word, but I think what he was talking about with resource-based economy is what you just explained. And I would say we should call it a needs-based economy. There you go. Oh, please write that into your book. (laughs) That sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, needs-based economy is exactly what we need. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, oh, back to your book. Did you get through the list of chapters that you were going to write? You were talking about gardening and then economy. They all, they all they they alternate between more tangible ideas and more nebulous ideas okay so we started with the 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 earth itself which would also be like how do we hold it together how do we own it collectively yeah. which is a little bit nebulous but basically yeah. planting trees planting gardens just the earth the resources yeah. the river what can we take and what can we not take how do we manage harvesting of forest and whatever and then yeah. the next level is the social welfare which is more nebulous it's okay. like how do we how does marriage work and stuff yeah. and how does divorce work and yeah. how does polyamory work 
And then the next one is more tangible. It's just like design, which gets into mathematics a little bit where you have symmetry and you have 1.618 fee ratio, which basically those two rules explain everything. As long as you design by those two rules, then everything's harmonious. And then the next one is more like Byron Katie where you have dialogue. Oh, we were gonna talk about that, yeah. So just, which is something that you're very good at is just being a very conscious, conscious listener and oh, very patient and thank you. reflecting listening. Oh, thank you. Wow. Well, I, thank you for saying that. Cause I, I work very hard at that and I wonder if I'm actually doing that all the time. So at least I'm getting somewhere if you're noticing that I'm trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely you. know that. Thank you. Hey, you're very good about that. Thank you. And well, sometimes you're, words are exactly like you take four or five six words in a row and they're exactly what i have said like you just like take snippets of exactly what i said and repeat it back to me and it, it really makes uh, me feel welcome that's great <laughs> that's called active listening right uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah and i i work really hard at that too because having a daughter has taught me that more than anything oh it's wow like, yeah. well in the sustainable communities movement you know working with um communication is super important and one of the things we talk about in that is, um, you know, conscious communication or um, what is now known as conscious communication. It was used to be, uh, what's that? I don't even remember what it used to be called, but it was, you know, the, the language where you have to um, acknowledge somebody without blaming them and saying that, you know, this is happening, but this is how I'm feeling. Yeah. What was that called before? Yeah. Nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication. Yeah. But now they took the word violent out of it and they're calling it uh -huh. compass compassionate communication. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But um, yeah, so uh, that's a really um, impactful languaging to me. But what I didn't hear very well or people doing very well with that, including myself, was reflecting back to the other person what you heard. Even though it was talked about in all the books, uh -huh. I think the, the emphasis was not on that, but the emphasis was on learning to communicate to people without blaming them which I totally right. love, but yeah. um, I, had to, I had to work for years on really making it a point to reflect back to people what you've heard. And I think what you just spoke to is kind of, because I have to be quick with my daughter, you can't just sit right. there and reflect back first. She's like, stop repeating what I'm saying. <laughs> you get snippets, you just get a little snippet <laughs> and you kind of have to yeah, yeah. rephrase it really quick. <laughs> <laughs> And she yeah. probably is good about doing that with you too, especially when she was younger. Oh, and now that she's getting say, older. <laughs> <laughs> now everything that I say, she either puts it back on me or she repeats it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But how, I wanted to um, recommend to you to listen to Ben Z. Munn's um, Back to the Land episode, episode two, and the people who are listening. Okay. Because both you and the people listening, if you are relating to anything we're talking about, Ben's episode also gets into some of these topics. One of the things we talked about was his interest in the book, A Pattern Language. Right. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, I just told somebody yesterday that I thought for a permaculture workshop, yeah, that would make a really great sub-workshop just teaching that alone. Cool. I mean, it sounds like your book is kind of influenced by those topics a little bit, yeah? Pattern language is definitely in the design aspect when I said right. the symmetry and 1.618. Pattern language will also be mentioned in that chapter or in that Perfect. section. It's, thank you. That's exactly why I mentioned pattern language because you had said that and I was like, oh gosh, this is all tying together. Uh -huh. So interesting. I love the mass consciousness right now. It's just, it feels like the veil is very thin. We're all tapping into source a lot more and we're all tapping into each other a lot more. And I think there's like the reality of there being this conscious grid that we're all connected to is like, or the Akashic records or whatever you want to call it. Uh -huh. It's, it's just like, so in my face these days, I can't deny that there's something there. I don't know about you. Yeah. 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 Can't deny it. <laughs> so cool. Okay. So we were talking about, um, pattern language and then oh you were talking about oh I, okay so i this was also a topic that was in yesterday's podcast and i feel like it's probably gonna blow your mind 
but I bet you've been thinking about the Anastasia Ringing Cedar of Russia books. Yeah. Have you? You've read them, right? Yeah, I've read them. I think we talked about that before. But it sounds yeah. like your book is totally touching on the topics of that. Like I the love her ideas about economics yeah. and gift economy. Yay. All right, cool. Yeah. And the whole village idea was like, that's her thing, right? Like, we got to get these little villages of 100 to 200 people, have our little number. number. Yeah. And like, have like our own one or two acre plot of land and not be like a commune, but everybody has their own domain. And you create this little world on your one or two own acres, but you live near 100 to 200 people. And that's the village. It's right. kind of like what you're describing, it sounds like. Yeah basically yeah yes we are all it. just kind of like i love it coming up with the same idea but the details yeah. are difficult for sometimes for people yeah. to imagine i love it's it like okay. we ahead. can have an idea of doing that and then where does the land come from because these days every people think they own the land yeah. so we have to make the agreement with the land owners yeah which complicates things you know what i was talking about yesterday maybe we can get into this a little bit i um flew over Paris or flew in we flew into Paris and I actually mistakenly said we flew out of Paris over England but we actually flew out of Zurich over to England and so we got to see quite a bit of Europe in those two flights and nice. and both of those flights coming low over France into Paris and then coming low over Zurich over Germany and then up over to London and over Brit we were really close to the ground in all those zone so we could see very clearly what the the layout of europe looked like and it yeah. was so different than america yeah totally <laughs> you know it's it's this whole little village idea it's like you got these little villages of you know anywhere between a hundred to a thousand families probably and you can very clearly see the little domains in the village yeah. like there's a little yard and their little house and they're all designed kind of circularly and then you see the fields and the fields are all kind of circularly arranged outside and it's and then it's like within walking distance like a, an hour to a day's distance there's another village and then another right. village and another village and then there's very few big metropolises like there's paris right. there's london but there's not like huge thirty thousand person cities everywhere it's actually quite the opposite it's like maybe ten thousand, but usually a lot smaller and so what i started to get the sense of is these obviously these towns and villages are remnants of thousands of years old you know societies that have been around doing this for a while and you know they didn't own the land it was like if anything a, like a, the king owned the land but because of that it, you, you don't have like you do in america where you have the one lonely farmer out in the middle of nowhere and his forty thousand acres and then the next lonely farmer out in the middle of nowhere and his forty thousand acres it's just like that's so different right. it's so different in america you know yeah so I loved seeing that because yeah. it gave me hope that like at least somebody on the planet kind of had it figured out. <laughs> yeah. And then we evolved. And then we evolved. <laughs> yeah. What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I talked to a friend the other day. She's, she's Russian. Her name's Alona. And maybe you're friends with her on Facebook too. I don't know. Alona Guzman? No. It's a, a long Russian name, like Listvyanka or something. I don't know. Oh, I might be friends with her. Yeah. But she recently uh, purchased a village in Spain. Oh, my and gosh. So she's what? Running, she's running into the, the ownership problem where she's kind of aiming at that more ancient paradigm where it's not even like pre-feudalism just like yeah. a tribe everybody owns it and everybody knows that everybody owns it right and no, but there's no one person that owns it or has control yeah and nobody's collecting rent for their own profit but she owns the land now because she bought the village so how does she get out of that because she doesn't want to just be a martyr and go around buying the world back for everyone because oh. she doesn't have money to buy the whole world back for everyone even though right. she wants to right so trying to That's solve cool. that. Oh man, she should write a blog about what she's doing. I'd follow that. Right, she should. She should. That's amazing. And you know, it might be a good opportunity for her to get ideas from other people too. Sure. Yeah. Well, 
Okay, so what? How do you spell her name? I'll put her in the Facebook here. I want to see if I can find her. Alana, do you remember? It's Alona with umlauts. A L O N A. Okay. The O has Alana Litovanskia. Yes, I see she came up. Yes. Co-creator right. of Nua, and we have definitely mutual friends. Yeah, you, Brian Arturo, and Raymond D. Powell. Cool. Yeah, all eco villagey friends. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Thank you for that. I will definitely let her know she was mentioned in our podcast and she should write a uh -huh. blog. <laughs> she has, sure. Paul, is there anything else you were dying to get into? I know we could have talked about Byron Katie, but maybe we could do that another episode. But what, anything else you're like just burning up to talk about? Uh, sometimes it's Sometimes it's difficult to talk about spiral dynamics, <gasps> and sometimes it's difficult to not have a to have a conversation without spiral dynamics. What so, did you know that's in my show notes? Spiral dynamics is yeah. No, I didn't even know this. Is, okay, again, this is freaking mass consciousness. I haven't talked about spiral dynamics in ten years, and it came oh, up nice. in conversation <laughs> with Mandy about within reach the other day. Because we were uh -huh. talking, talking about things. We're actually doing, working on in secret on some ancillary items to bring back out uh -huh. to the public because we're about to have our 10-year anniversary of that movie coming out. And oh, nice. we, we, we have like 1,000 hours of footage just sitting unused on hard drives that needs to get out to the world. And we're yeah. also realizing that the world is changing. And so a lot of that information may be a little bit outdated. And how can we make it relevant? And we're thinking about doing things like um, letting people who we interviewed see their interview and then bringing them on a podcast and hey 10 years in later now well, how do you feel about that old interview about sustainable communities and what do you think yeah. now what do you think now and stuff like that you know so we should interview you because I knew you back almost like eight years ago yeah yeah so we, sh we should talk about Spire Dynamics on that podcast and see you know what people's thoughts were in the communities movement about spiral dynamics 10 years ago and what they are now but here you are talking about it dang it that's awesome <laughs> yeah i thought of it a, a moment ago when you were talking about the the looking down on this the smaller villages in europe yeah and thinking about how land tenure models have evolved from yeah. the tribal spiral dynamics purple yeah. to the feudalism where somebody branched off from the tribe and it was like actually i'm going to claim all of this and then you guys can pay me yeah so, so then they have this file dynamics red and then the blue somebody got a lot of land and called themselves the king and then suddenly you have a, a whole kingdom yeah and then we just kept evolving eventually we have Ayn Rand's capitalism and then later on we have uh back to the earth communities so in some sense we're coming full circle yes Okay, so for those of us who haven't studied uh, spiral dynamics in a while or never studied it, do you want to give us a little summary of it? And then I can post some information in the show notes to let people dive in deeper. Okay. Cool. Well, first, I think it's important that everyone know that there's two different kinds of hierarchy. And dominance hierarchies are no good. We don't want that. That's what everyone thinks when you say hierarchy and yes. they get mad a lot of times when we mention hierarchies and they should because dominance hierarchies are, are pretty much power hungry and, and rather bad. Yes. So secondly, we have gross hierarchies which exist in nature and we've all gone through them from being little kids to growing up and societies go through this gross process also. So that said, sometimes it's nice to alternate between the society and the individual, just so it paints a better picture. And shall I do that and go to all seven levels? Yeah, Let's sure. See. I have them pulled up right now. So I'm looking at them and thinking, yeah, let's dive into this really quick. Okay. Well, there's, there's a whole community around, around uh, evolutionary psychology and it's called integral okay. community okay integral and it's around 
Ken Wilbert, but I'm going to specifically use spiral dynamics languaging and spiral dynamics colors instead of their color system because their okay. their their whole language is very more detailed and complex, and I like to keep it simple. Okay. So first, you have a beige yeah. circle. Let's imagine six, seven circles stacked on top of each other. Okay. In a growth hierarchy, not in a dominance hierarchy. Okay. In a growth hierarchy. So the bottom one is beige in color, and it represents, from an individual perspective, uh, the hunter-gatherer, or the, from an individual perspective, the like the infant child, just completely in survival mode, helpless, can't do, can't think about anything except what's in the present moment. Primal, the, a, like that. Almost they call it the what are they, the lizard brain or whatever. Yeah, reptilian. Yeah, reptilian yeah. Reptilian brain. Yeah. Yeah. So the at that level of development and from a social perspective we have the hunter gatherers that nobody had there was no social or architecture whatsoever it was just like every man and woman for themselves somebody kills a a, a mammoth or whatever and then they get their piece and then everybody else can come later it's not like a sharing situation it's more just like i'm going to get mine and then whatever is left you right. guys can have it right I, every man for himself yeah yeah and so then eventually we evolved to the the purple sphere where we decided well if we share it could be way more efficient so then we kind of evolved into having tribes okay socially yeah and then as an individual the purple sphere is like the little kids and they, they, they come away from the mother's breast and they, they start to understand that there's, they have friends and they have a family. So they start to, rather than identifying with the mother, now they're identifying with the family or the peer group. Love it. And then the next level red is when, as from an individual perspective is when the child is like, well, I'm not my family. I'm not my friends. I am me, <laughs> me, me, mine, mine, mine. They start saying me and mine all the time. Yeah. Which my daughter at six years old is already doing, but that's another yeah, story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> They're so, evolving quicker up this train, this spiral. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's a tricky one to, to analyze a tricky level to analyze too, because, because we're all still developing spiritually yeah. so if if that level of development gets stuck in it in a in a selfish ego paradigm then it can get really bad and that's why on a social mm. level we have organizations like al-qaeda and taliban because they're like stuck at that level of like it's all about me and i'm just going to mine right so we also have maybe you could say like wwf wrestling is maybe <laughs> or, or even football or soccer or boxing is expressing that level of development in a healthy yeah. way right socially it's like a team sport yeah interesting yeah that reminds me of have you ever seen the read the book ecotopia by ernest Kallenbeck? I I know the book. I haven't read that one either. Oh, Ecotopia! It's 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 almost amusing, but it's it, it's fun and it brings up some good issues. But it's just like it's kind of this book about the West Coast seceding from the Union, and uh -huh. and they come oh, no. from this, they're formed this own their own women led government, and it's it's the the nation, nation's called Ecotopia. And, oh yeah. Um, yeah, and like one of the things in it is they the women have created a culture where men can still get that phase of their their needs met by doing these competitive sports that are kind of brutal. Uh -huh. They're kind of brutal, and it actually goes back to the idea that actually native cultures used to do this too. Like there are these Mayan sports where they would have these sticks and like there'd be a ball and they'd go around and try to get the ball, but hey, if you happen to get in the way, I beat you with my stick kind of thing. And people could yeah. die. People would like die in these sports and stuff. So uh -huh. I'm not a fan of like killing people, but I thought it was very interesting that even in this peace loving harmonized world that's idealized in Ecotopia, they still have these sports, <laughs> these yeah, yeah. sports. 
<laughs> yes, that's a great example. Oh, and by the way, I think they only did it like once a year and it was very ceremonial. And it was like something all the men would like train for. And it was like a big honor to be invited into the game and to yeah. try to be victorious or I don't know. Anyways, yeah. do you, do you think that's something that is like beneficial to the spiral dynamics discussion? Like yeah, I think those kind the, of things. If we just let, if there's no, like, sometimes these things express themselves in the spiral dynamics community doesn't like me to say unhealthy and healthy, but I don't okay. really know how to explain it. Okay. But some, I think I feel like there can be unhealthy expression and healthy expression. And so yeah. competition sports are a more healthy expression than fun, uh, radical fundamentalists going yeah. around cutting people's heads off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ooh, yes. Okay. Good point. Good point. <laughs> But then the blue level is next after red when people or or societies evolve to understanding like a, a sort of like commonality where we have organized religions. Everybody's like, okay, mm. it's not this tribe and that tribe and this tribe and that tribe. It's not, it's not me rallying troops to, to, support or prove my individual superiority it's more of we're all here together and every village and every individual agrees that this god is the only god or that whatever sort of religious code of conduct is agreed upon by everyone and that also comes to like national Nation, nationalism there or which is something that Black people who community. aren't religious could relate to in that stage of the evolution right yeah yeah yes yes absolutely it doesn't you don't have to be religious right. you don't have to evolve through religion you yeah. just have to evolve through uh identifying with a common yeah. denominator socially so it could be yeah. like i'm american american <laughs> that that's definitely blue <laughs> Yeah. The plea, I'm going to join the army, even though I may never kill anyone. And that's not my goal. It's just, I want to be a patriot and that's what patriots do. Yes. So that's also blue and it can be very healthy. And that and, looks, that's also back in history, back in like the world war two era where, absolutely. I mean, like people were like so proud to join up, even though they didn't realize what they're getting themselves into with war. But yeah, that exact, this was more about a cause than, yeah or an identity than the act of killing is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And then the, the next level is the orange where we have academia, we have universities, we have science, we have everything's deterministic and reducible. And mm. <laughs> we also have, uh, Wall Street and macroeconomics and free market capitalism. Uh, it's funny you're talking about the reductionism. We were just yeah. talk, we were just constantly and I were talking over dinner about the reductionism of science, and uh -huh. and the, the the part that that's been reduced is the spiritual aspect. Oh, that's a funny take on it. Yeah, right? I get it. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's a whole nother discussion, but you could talk about like quantum physics being left out of the theory of relativity or you know on and on and on yeah yeah i really like that the quantum physics in the 30s came came up with different ideas to undo the the reductionism in some sense like heisenberg's uncertainty principle like the only thing we can be certain scientifically certain about is that we're uncertain i love it yeah <laughs> yeah and and even even einstein spoke similar words you know I, yeah what was his famous one um that science basically proves religion or spirituality to him or something like that right yeah yeah it just he used the word god but i don't I think okay he used it loosely yeah <laughs> I love that. I mean, it's like the more you know, the more you know you don't know, but we have gotten ourselves in this 
society that likes to think we know it all. Right. Yeah. So this is that stage, right? <laughs> Rationality. I think the quantum physics is more e evolved. I, yeah. I, not to complicate the conversation, but we go through time cycles yeah. also collectively. Yeah. And not only is this like a new age sort of thing, like the procession of the equinoxes every 26,000 years, but it's also verifiable by historians in mm -hmm. a book called The Fourth Turning. And they predicted in 1996 that we would be in a crisis right now, which is oh. obviously happening. What? And so in the 1930s, wow. I think we were catching a wave, like we had the roaring 20s, mm -hmm. and then we started to decline there. But at the end of the roaring 20s is when quantum physics came. It's like humanity's like sort of consciousness is elevated through the peaks of these waves. And so yes. we come up with ideas, but then we fall back into the wake. So uh. right now we're experiencing how we're coming into a crisis. We're falling back down into the wake. Wow. And then according to this book, The Summer of Love, 1967, will return, it doesn't say anything about the summer of love, I'm just making a reference to yeah. time cycles. 80 years, it's just the time cycle, will be 2050. Okay. So we'll be back to like the late 60s around 2050. But that has nothing to do with spiral dynamics whatsoever. I just think it's interesting. You're <laughs> onto something there too. And I, I, I get where you're going with that. That's it's kind of like popular culture attached to spiral dynamics. I love that. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, because you could look at each of these events in popular culture, like the hippies, like you're saying, and the 60s, uh -huh. and, and attach them to a, 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 high, a rise and a fall. Right. Yeah, and, and it's 80, interesting. Oh, go ahead. 80 years before the hippies was the peak of the last cycle. And so that would have been the same time that we had a huge spiritual sort of awakening. Oh the theosophical society madame blavatsky uh rudolf wow. steiner later in the 30s but also the 30s had a, a a smaller wave like we were just talking about do you think physics. that had anything to do with the war or the depression i think the war and depression had to do with the time cycle interesting yeah other so way cool. around kind of okay well do you have you ever heard of the folk singer john craigie yeah i've heard of him he's from portland well, actually, he's from California, where I'm from, and that's where I knew him originally, but he, he's out of Portland now, and he's got a really funny song that relates to this, because when um, tr the night that Trump was elected, he, yeah. was, he was supposed to do, be doing a show, <laughs> and you can imagine how that show probably didn't oh, yeah. go very well, because everybody right, was right, unhappy right, in right. the audience. <laughs> Right. As the TVs are showing that Trump is winning and he's on stage, he's like, crap, man, this show sucks. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah, yeah. And so he was joking in the song he wrote about that night about how he knew that this was not going to be a very good show because he was backstage before the show started and it was not looking good. And um, the, the show host came back to him backstage and said, now, John, you've probably got a song about this whole election thing to share with us, right? And he's like, no. And she's like, well, you better go write one right now. So he pulled a song out of his butt in like 15 minutes. And so what he did is he went on the computer and he did a bunch of research about Republicans being the presidents and what the societies looked like for the liberal artists when that was happening. Wow. And, and the musicians. And, he's, and he joked in the song about how what he found out in that 15 minutes was that, you know, the worst music came out when Democrats were in the presidency. And right, the best, right. The best music came out when Republicans were in the presidency. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because they're times of crisis for a liberal artists, and they're forced yes. to be creative. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, totally true. Right. I mean, the Vietnam War produced some of the best music ever. It's true, right? Totally. And I think these times of crisis, I, I just have to say, I always tell Constance as a visual artist, I can get myself in a big slump when everything's loving and happy and left. I just, it's like, I forget about how to create art, but when, yeah. time, when times are tough and I, or I'm really sad or I'm really upset with about something, it, whether it be in the world or our personal lives, my art actually does really good. And it's, it's like, it's a, it's a muse. Like my pain is a muse. And I think that's, 
pretty common for a lot of artists. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> The Sylvia Plath complex or something like it's, that. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Are, I imagine that you're an artist or you have some form of artistry to you. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? What is yours? I play mandolin and guitar. And oh. I also, when I do visual art, it's usually very intellectual. I know I'm not very good with colors, but I'm, I've noticed in the detail, I'm not, just not good at it myself, I don't feel like. But I'll I mean, do lots of symbols and numbers and different alphabets and words in many languages. And that's kind great. of like Masonic, Masonic art or something. Uh, I'll do. What about um, mandala art? A little bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. not like, not like uh, free form. Okay. More like very structured geometric stuff. Right, that's <laughs> what I was thinking of. I can see you doing like those beautiful sand mandalas where every little grain of sand comes out of a little tube and you color this. Yes. Massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do yeah. that as a practice. I mean, the That's color cool. shock tantra. Yeah. That's great. Paul, you just spoke a lot about yourself there. I love that. You are an artist and you have a very technical side to it. That's really cool. And that, that explains your systems thinking really well. Okay. So back to this, last couple of levels of spiral dynamics do you want to help us out with that we left off at the orange which is the okay. academic in the wall street and right right they seem to alternate between me and we and me and we and me and we so okay. the first yeah. the beige is a me oh yeah yeah every yeah. man for himself and then the, the purple is the tribal we and then back to the individual me 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 the red okay. and then the the church congregation or the the national patriotism is we 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 again yeah and then the individualist is like the reductionist scientific yeah king that says uh i the the free market capitalism says like i have freedom to create my own business and yes. whatever yes so individualist and then we go to a we again which is the green which says we should live in community and go mm. back to the earth and wow but every level includes the previous yeah i see that and so we're kind of in between the orange and the green right now it feels like as a society as a, as a collective society i i would say that we can see that on facebook and, and yeah. if it, yeah, it's hard to say. But yeah, I think we're over the tipping point of like having 15% of the population that's on board the green bandwagon, okay. finally, evolutionarily. So yeah, we're moving that direction now. That's, There's no that's huge. Back. That's huge. I mean, that for me is so exciting to hear you say that because that's kind of the topic that Amanda and I am, and Derek have been talking about um, revisiting for Within Reach. And we, mm -hmm. actually, we actually are calling the ancillary projects Reach, uh, Redefined Community. Nice. Because, because, yeah, because it seems like in the past 10 years since we saw a resurgence of interest in community that that interest has waned, like you were talking about, peaks and right. valleys. And it seems like now we, even before COVID, literally before COVID, we had been discussing bringing back within reach because I had been just simply curious as to what happened to a sustainable community? Like, is anybody even right. interested in that anymore? And yeah. I, I mean, I know I've changed, but I'm still in, vaguely interested in it and seeing yeah. it be successful. And then all of a sudden COVID happened and then now it's like totally irrelevant conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? It is funny. Huh? It did kind yeah. of like fade out. I also noticed some paradoxical things with the COVID thing. And the, I understand that it's a necessity. Yeah. And it's also ironic that in the past few years so many people have been saying that we need to get away from our phones because they're creating social distancing and now everybody's like we want social distancing oh my god <laughs> and we're on our phones so bizarre oh man i think it was you was it you or somebody else a while back during covid that posted like the last thing we need is social distancing. Was it you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw that and post. I, I loved it. It impacted me. Yeah, yeah. I th I think it, 
but most a lot of my posts I like I'm, I'm trying to understand what's going on and yeah. so posting as experiments because I want to understand what people are thinking so sometimes I'll post something that's contrary to what's happening in the moment yeah. in the media so that I can understand through responses what the hell's going on <laughs> right I'm with you I do that too lately and more and more I'm like today I posted the first paragraph of David Wilcox's book Ascension Mysteries because it's mm -hmm. this beautiful vision of the future of like fourth dimension existence and right. I, I, I kind of posted it to be like all right y'all how weird do you think this is or do you <laughs> yeah. and yeah, I, yeah. I, I liked some of the responses it was pretty it was intriguing Okay, so we're almost at that level, by the way, fourth dimension, I think. What are the next two levels all about? The green level is the one that most of the people watching this podcast probably will identify with. Community because one? Yeah. Community, yeah. yeah. So basically everybody kind of can intuit or just know what that means because that's yeah. where they're at. Like right. we we don't want capitalism to be mowing down the forest we don't want right. we want equality for women in the workplace and across the board we want equality for people of all races and creeds and yeah. so on and so forth however the green has this special quality where it tends sometimes to refute the orange and refute the blue it doesn't want capitalism it doesn't want money. It wants to go off the grid mm -hmm. and live the gift economy, even yeah. though it doesn't know how to do that in a holistic and sustainable way. Right. It doesn't want church. It doesn't want any organized religion, really. It doesn't even want Buddhism if it's another religion. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> want. That's You're literally speaking to all the things that are, in hindsight, 10 years later, what I'm going to talk about how I've redefined the community. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So then if it refutes these two things, if it doesn't want a nation state, it doesn't want Trump's government, not my president, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It doesn't, it hasn't developed its orange. It's, it's passed through the blue and the orange, but it, it's not fully developed enough or not being um, embraced. So without orange and blue to stand on, it just falls down to red and gets really angry and blameful. Oh God, that's it. Yes. The angry blaming. Yeah. I remember it, like activists, activism. Urgh. Yes. Yes. The, yeah. the activists, they, they, yeah. they, they're kind of green, but they fall down to the red because yeah. they refute the orange and the blue. Yeah. And the, the women a lot of times are the more effeminate. We don't like to use a gender, because that complicates things also. Yeah. But a lot of people that are not very aggressive kind of personalities, they will then not identify with the red. So then they drop down to purple. And okay. that's what we see a lot of in, in Hawaii where people are talking about fourth dimension or bringing down, making heaven on earth and right. women wear purple and everything's perfect and happy and harmonious and we're going to go yeah. do ayahuasca and live like the tribal people but they they don't realize that 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 we've already evolved through that right. we need to take the next level and we need wow paul we need some sort of social cohesion in blue and we need some sort of economic sustainability in orange otherwise we're not going to be sustainable at green paul this is beautiful I am so touched by this. Um, I was talking to a friend yesterday who was talking about how um, similar this Sacred Rebel podcast is. I guess it's just kind of we're all in this like similar place of these important discussions that need to happen right now. Yeah. You know, and like I think it's creating a lot of memes in the in the the landscape of discussion right now, and pod, especially podcasts. Um, so our friend Tara, who's uh, Tara Brown, she's like a psychic friend of Constance's and we found her on Facebook and she's been listening to some of the podcasts Constance has been doing. She recommended this pos this beautiful podcast yesterday um, that I listened to. It's called Cosmic, not Cosmic, Discord, Cosmic Matrix. 
Um, and they were talking about how we don't really want to get it back into that phase where, you know, like new age has gotten kind of overdone, you know, it's like the new age bandwagon, you know? Yeah. And like, we kind of need to evolve past that now and not just be, you know, spouting off new age lingo and popular ideas that are just for an elite few new age people or whatever. Right. right? Yeah. So, right, right. and I, I like what you just said about that going back to Kauai kind of thing. That's what yeah. we experienced on Kauai. It was kind of, you just drop off and you, you fall into this almost neutral place where like, I'm not pro this, I'm not negative this, I'm just, I just am. But then you're just like this neutral nothing. Yeah. Anyways, I thought that was cool because they mentioned this last night and I was like, yeah, Paul, you're on to something they're talking about too. Yeah. The Gene Keith, th there's, a, there's a lot of we're not we haven't gone through all the steps here yet yeah we're getting so there the yellow is what in spiral dynamics they call the the momentous leap it's oh. like suddenly break free of all of these different <laughs> limited views mm. but even though the green has transcended all the previous groups they've also included all those previous groups they just don't identify with them so mm. then once we right. step outside of those six we're suddenly like oh i'm all of those i need <laughs> to meet the needs of everyone oh beautiful. I need to meet the needs of essentially i need to what are what are donald trump's needs we yeah. have to if we want him to serve us we're gonna have to meet his needs or else he's just gonna run amok and make a mess of right things. obviously his needs are to be paid attention to and to right. Be, to be loved and right. to, be, to be needed as our savior. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can pretend that if, if, if that's what he needs. Well, at least some of us can. Right. <laughs> but that's a very interesting point because somebody and I were talking about the other day about this. Oh, Taylor, uh, we did a, a flip podcast. So I have two podcasts right now, the flip and then this one, Sacred Rebel. And on the flip, Taylor was telling his story about postpartum male, male postpartum depression and going through having a kid and being depressed and not being the parent he wanted to be with that kid. And he was talking about how he through therapy realized something I had realized through shamanic healing, which is embracing our inner child and loving that inner child through its tantrums, you know, and like the tantrums are caused right. by traumas that happened when you were kids that never got um, worked out, you know, and yeah. this inner child in us. And I think probably in most people, is crying out for attention and hey listen to me i'm not happy right now and it's like we just tell it to shut up all the time it's like how about just holding it and embracing it like you're saying and then saying oh you're right i'm sorry yeah let's, yeah let's let's honor this need you have you're familiar with root for sheldrake right no the root? morphogenetic fields guy <gasps> no i've been wanting to talk or look into that okay morphogenetics fields and then what's his name rupert, rupert. Sheldrake? yep Goodness. okay thank you for that these are all going to go in the show notes people so you can look there cool look at that all right more what is port more for genetic field how can we heal, heal the earth in a short time study the principles of peace peace work so it's like parapsychology it's definitely par i guess we could call it parapsychology from a spiral dynamics perspective, okay. Okay. I think a lot of people might call it turquoise, which is the eighth level, which I wasn't going to talk about. But since we're getting a little bit new age, we could go there. <laughs> Please. And I would like <laughs> we, to we, by that. the way, we got to coin a new term because obviously new age is like <laughs> one of these lower levels that we got to move past, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Consciousness the purple, evolved. I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> the, per the purple identify like the, there's a, the, we can call it an octave it's not even though there's only six basic spheres okay. but if we say that the beige is the same as the yellow to some degree yeah but, but the yellow can see all six and the beige can only see beige so then when you get to the turquoise the turquoise is like an octave of the purple so purple okay. only sees purple but the turquoise can see all of the levels and so basically people who aren't looking at the 
by the way, if you if you get a chance, people to pull up, uh, just type in Google Spiral Dynamics, and there's all these images and graphics of what we're talking about. But if you don't know what he's talking about right now, he, he there's kind of like this. Think about DNA and the spiraling up of a DNA strand, um, and there's some of these beautiful images that are just even showing just like different circles like he's talking about that go up and these different up levels can see what's below them but when you're below you can't see what's up is what you're saying right okay in the first six years you we only see wherever we're at we only see our own perspective but then at second tier which is yeah. everything past green yeah we can see that we are everything we still can't see what's above us because we haven't got there yet yeah. but we can see everything below us Okay. not just where we're at yeah so you were talking about children uh having tantrums yeah i feel like from a dharma perspective the the way that we create anger is through having mental aversion so if yeah. i have an aversion to donald trump i'm going to get angry yeah that's how i create anger and there's another thing with the morphogenetic field where if, some, if I'm in a room full of people who have an aversion to Donald Trump and they're all angry, but I don't have an aversion to Donald Trump, I still get that anger. I'm still in that morphogenetic field. Right. And I feel like so, a lot of times when I see children having a tantrum, if I'm paying close attention, I, it seems like maybe the parents in some cases, sometimes it's the children that's creating the anger right. from their own mental aversion. Right. I don't want to go to bedtime. Right. I want to stay up. So they're creating their own tantrum. Right. And sometimes the anybody in the family or in the child's vicinity could have repressed anger issues that they're not expressing. And so it just comes out of the child naturally because they don't have any social construct yet that says, oh, you're not supposed to get angry and scream. Right. So they can actually process for the parents or for anybody else that they're around. Interesting. Which yeah. would be scary for some people to think, oh, wait, the children are expressing my anger. That's not good. I don't want that. That's so interesting. I'll never forget the story of this Papa who's like a B-list celebrity in Hollywood. He was in the store with his dad, who he loves dearly, and his son. And his dad and him have this special relationship because his dad always nurtured his feelings, which helped him become a famous actor or semi-famous uh -huh. semi actor. And um, so his dad and him were in the store and the, his son, so the grandpa or the dad's, the dad and then his dad, so the grandpa, father and son. So the son was literally having this exact same tantrum you're talking about on the floor of the grocery store and everybody around was getting really uncomfortable. And a quote normal reaction to that as a parent would be to shush your child because right. you don't want them to be making this fuss in the store and bother bothering everybody right and this is actually brought up in ecotopia too it's the same scenario was happening but on the street and an argument was happening between a, two lovers a man and a woman in the street of ecotopia which happened to be downtown san francisco and in both oh. these situations the question is raised should you stop having these shows of emotion, these dysfunctional shows of emotion. And, and the result in both of them was no, you should let them play out no matter where they are. And that's the gist of what I learned in my shamanic healing of let this child experience what it needs to experience instead of shushing it and putting it down and saying, stop. It's like, let, yeah, me, yeah. let me feel. And that's what we've learned to do with our daughter. And any, anybody who's like experienced depression, don't oppress that depression, experience right. it, feel it, let it work itself out. And so the dad and the son, the grandpa and the dad just smiled at each other and just let the kid scream about the cookies on the floor for a while until he cried it out. Uh -huh. And everybody just kind of went back to know their thing in the store, which was so beautiful. And he was, he was writing this post on Instagram about saying how he witnessed the public being so gracious today in the store. And then how he and his dad had a special moment afterwards when they left the store and this, the, the scene was normalized and the kid was okay because he and his dad, you know, realized that the dad had taught the son to feel his emotions. And now that the, you know, the grandpa had taught the father to feel his emotions when he was a kid and it helped him become a better actor. And now here was the son allowing his 
kid to do this in public and the dad was so proud or the grandpa was so proud of his son just saying you learned something great and you're now gifting this to the world and it was a very special moment of bonding for them and I think that's so beautiful because I think most people's reactions would be what you let your kid have a tantrum in the grocery store you know <laughs> What are your yeah. thoughts? On, what are your thoughts on that? Is that kind of similar? I think that's great. Yeah, just yeah. let let that stuff express itself. That's right. great. Is that relate to this integrating and of this all the different levels below? Kind of like a similar thought process there. In relation to, like letting things that are coming up, like that fist of willpowered activism coming up, and and the the need for the need for identity and the need for, you know, self entrepreneurialism and community, like all these levels that have their needs, you're saying, let those just feel needed is the, the higher second to highest level of spiral dynamics, the yellow level. Oh yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. The second tier is all about meeting the needs of all levels. Yeah. Is that a good so way to look at it then? Okay. Yeah. And you know, I have to say too, and I don't know what the last level is here. I'll let you speak to it. But when you were talking about Trump, uh, my wife and I have come to this kind of acceptance of our allowance of Trump because we feel like, you know, we've been learning more about evolution and ascending and doing a lot of research on that. And we, for example, we love that show um, on the Gaia network. If you haven't seen it yet, um, it's called initiation with this guy named Mateo. Um, it's amazing. And it's something that really gets to the root of what the whole, different dimension he explains like all the different dimensions so it kind of reminds me of spiral dynamics right um yeah it's just amazing and um he talks in that about how a person like trump or a person like hitler are actually playing a very important part in our evolution to other higher dimensions or higher levels of ascendance and understanding because without their role we can't like that you can't find that pain that you need to get to to use as a muse to create that next level of understanding or create that next level art or music or whatever yeah is that kind of how you would say that too not to mention that it's hard for us to meet the needs of of north korea it's Mm. hard for us to meet the needs of china but Mm. trump knows how to do that because that's where he's at they're seeing eye to eye there (laughs) <laughs> so if he can if he can work yeah. out a good business deal cuz that's what he does yeah then that's good for all of us because we don't know what to do with china because we can't communicate with them cuz we're not at red or orange right beautiful we're at green okay and so we oh go ahead and from a second tier perspective yeah Sometimes I, I just I just use yellow to express the idea that it it it, it comprises all of the previous six levels. Yeah. And so talking about a second tier perspective, sometimes it, it can sound pretentious and it doesn't need to be because we're all everything. Yeah. It's just a level of perspective. So then that next level of turquoise. Yeah. The level eight. Yeah. Okay. The highest level. The the highest level is. It's like the like the different dimensions on Gaia Network that you're talking about. Yeah. If we're experiencing that, Esther Hicks is experiencing. Esther a, Hicks is amazing. She's she's expressing a turquoise level of development, and Abraham Hicks is the voice. Bashar is the same thing. Daryl Anka is channeling through his turquoise level of of development. I love it. I got to listen to him. I've been hearing him a lot more. Um, Constance has been listening to Joe or Constance. Who's that guy you've been listening to? Oh, geez. I'll get back. I'll put it in the show notes, but there's a guy who a podcast. Um, he's the guy that was in um, What the Bleep Do We Know? And he talked about quantum physics. Right. Uh, I can't remember his name. Anyways, it'll come. I'll Google it right now. But yeah, so you're talking about um, this highest level. Uh, is What's the name of that level? 
Joe Dispenza. Uh, By the way, that guy's Joe Dispenza. Oh yeah, Joe Dispenza. He's talking about like quantum physics and stuff. But yeah, there's so, this first tier and second tier. And the first, second tier only really has two levels that we really talk about, although theoretically there's six there also. And oh theoretically gosh. there's a third tier, but humans can't really go there yet. So okay. we don't talk about it. And we so, don't even talk about turquoise that much. Okay. But since we've already started. Let's do it. Let's finish this. Yeah. What do we what do we need to know about that level? We need to know that if we're having a transcendent experience, then maybe we're we're operating from a turquoise level of development. Beautiful. But if we if we like the ideas of ringing cedar series, that doesn't yeah. mean that we're turquoise just because we like the idea of a turquoise person who lives in the woods. Okay. So yeah, Anastasia. and ringing cedars is a great example because that woman who lived in the woods, whose name was Anastasia, had all these spiritual gifts that were beyond what we can even comprehend doing on earth like having a a ball of energy that we can look into and it sees anywhere on the earth and she can interact with it and help people out in that place on the earth that she's seeing into. it's like what that's not possible but she's yeah. tra she was transcendent so that i see she's what you're turquoise. saying yeah. she's fully stepped into her turquoise level of development wow that's amazing but just because i like those books doesn't mean that i'm turquoise that right. means i'm purple <laughs> <laughs> you <you're, laughs> you yep okay <laughs> <laughs> that's me expressing my purple level of development if i'm like I, I i don't see any fairies in the room right now but i really yeah. love fairies and i really believe in them even if i haven't seen one i really believe in them that's purple and that's the the second to last lowest level which is kinship safety security that kind right. of stuff. Yeah. Okay. But when I fully unlock all of the first tier levels and I really step into the embodiment of my whole being at all levels of development, then I can see maybe I actually see a fairy, <laughs> which would be turquoise. Hey, my, my daughter sees a butterfly and thinks she's chasing a fairy or she'll see a true, nap, true. you know, and I love that. I think that's beautiful. That's a good question. Good point too, because some children are not fully developed in turquoise, but they do actually see fourth dimensional entities. Ooh, I definitely agree with that. That gets into a whole topic I have in my show notes, which is talking about rainbow children or indigo children right. have now become the new generation is like rainbow children and they're like, or crystal children or whatever. But the point is that they've evolved, they're evolving and they're like yeah. tapping into different dimensions. And I, I definitely have witnessed my daughter doing that. Uh -huh. it's amazing i think any parent can really witness it especially between the ages of like zero to four it's just, just it's amazing like she used to like she'd be in a room and we'd be like all on the bed laying down and she'd be staring off and to the distance and like touching something interacting with something maybe even babbling at something and she would laugh and we're like, what is she talking to? And we're like, oh, well, pff, probably an angel or a spirit or something, you know? Something's happening. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if, if we develop ourselves on every level, then when we have those experiences, they would be turquoise. And if we're not mm -hmm. developed in all of the first six, then yeah. those experiences are generally purple. Okay. But, uh, I think this is really relevant um, with what Matthias talks about in initiation because uh, his name is Matthias de Stefano, for those of you who aren't aware of him. And his show is really interesting because as he dry describes the different dimensions, they're very similar to Spiral Dynamics. And um, the interesting thing is that he even has a hard time describing the ninth dimension, which is really like source. But like even getting to the level before source, it's like almost having to describe sacred geometry and math because what starts happening is as we get higher in different dimensions, we're fractalizing. And then you start talking about parallel universes and infinite, infinite um, possible dimensions. It's just like, you're right. There's like almost a, like a, a concept that's beyond what we can comprehend right now or at least visualize. And we might like the idea of it, but we really can't quite 
it's not quite in our plane of existence to understand it right now. So I see what you're saying. Like you don't need to really talk about the eighth level in spiral dynamics because it's really not something that practically we can kind of embody. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, it's useful yeah. as an individual, but talking yeah. about it openly, I mean, once we learn the system and the language, then yeah. we have it, use it internally. Cool. And we're having a conversation, we just really need the first six. Okay. I mean, if you, if we, once we get the second tier, it's either going to be understanding the whole system, which is yeah. yellow, yeah. or it's going to be experiencing transcendent subjective yeah. experiences, which you can't share with that with anyone else anyway. So right. why talk about it? That's kind of how I feel about my ayahuasca experience. Right. It's like, and I th a lot of people who've done, I have you done ayahuasca? Yeah, yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, a couple of times. I've done it once and I just feel like it's almost pointless trying to explain it to somebody because it's like what we're talking about. It's just like, how do you explain the cosmic yeah. inter interface that I experienced? You know, it's like, right. it just doesn't make sense when you talk about it. Yeah. In some sense, it might bump us up to purple or up to turquoise for the duration of that journey. Ooh. But then we naturally come back down into right. okay. wherever our center of balance is Ooh, afterwards. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so on that note, do you think that it's going to take something like an ascended ascension level event for us to ever be able to get to the turquoise level? Or what are your thoughts on all that? Uh, we're evolving as a species, so yeah. Ken Wilbur, who is Ooh, kind of taken spiral dynamics and ran with it. Wow, I love his work. He wrote in Boomeritis, one of his books, that yeah. he kind of hinted at the idea that the level past turquoise, and this is a fiction book. Okay. He was suggesting that the next level past turquoise, after we we can tap into channeling or communicating with with extraterrestrials or with angels or like have direct telepathic experiences, yeah, at at turquoise, yeah, we'll, we'll get to the coral, which there is actually another color in spiral dynamics that nobody ever talks about, yeah, and uh, it's AI and software it's not actually human it's an extension of human wow so maybe elon musk's Neuralink will lead us to turquoise and coral very quickly we don't know yet okay <laughs> interesting now i agree with you on that and i've also been wondering if the ai is an option but it would be more of like wearing glasses whereas like meditation or a more organic way of reaching those ascended places would be more of like the sustainable way to get there do you know what i mean does that make sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like i like idea. having technology do it for you is sure you can do that but wouldn't it be nice to just get there more organically and naturally and have it really yeah. sink, sink in yeah it seems like there's two different proclivities some yeah. people are trans transhumanist transhumanist right yeah and some people are back to the earthers yeah i i have no problem with people who want to in 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 some way ex, you know escape into that through technology but i think personally like yeah i'm more of a natural kind of guy <laughs> yeah i am too are you yeah but i think they're on, you're like, on to something there Sorry, what were you saying? One of my uh, one of one of my many fascinations lately has been like, okay, transhumanism. We're gonna eventually upload our consciousness to a machine, mm. and from a perspective, which is absolutely immutably true. Although the wheel of dharma is turning, and even the the human perception of what consciousness is is evolving although consciousness may not be evolving so to speak the way we perceive it is so if in tibetan buddhism and dharma it is said that we cannot reach enlightenment without a precious human body which is why we always want to be reincarnated as a human we don't want to go to heaven 
We don't want to go to hell. We don't want to become an animal. We want to be a human. So if we upload our consciousness to a computer, that's not human, so to speak. It's an extension of human. Can we be enlightened from a computer? Do we continually evolve and have the ability to become enlightened from a transhumanist perspective? We don't know yet because no Buddha has ever been able to comment on that. Yeah. Well, my guess is like, I mean, I I do understand that AI, the whole idea, like what's that? There's the test for the robot, right? What's uh, Asimov's test to see if the robot has consciousness or whatever? Uh, Yeah. What is the Turing test and the Asimov's? The Turing. Thank you. The Turing test. Yes. So that in implies that the the robot is conscious and can evolve and get smarter but at the same time it's also been programmed by humans so i feel like personally that 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 touch of humans limits it to a perspective that only the computer the computer can only go a certain length of its evolution because I, i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about but i think I will admit that I have this this inkling, thanks to Buddhism, I've studied Tibetan Buddhism too, that the whole, there, and I was kind of touching on it earlier with, I think there's this idea that you can cheat your way into enlightenment. There are other methods that we've talked about in my, in my Sangha. Um, some of the things we've talked about are like ayahuasca or, right. um, or, or we, you know, using marijuana or mushrooms um, or, um, getting involved in a practice like I got involved in, which is um, a high Tibetan Lama only initiated practice, but that was given to Western students. And what was happening is we were burning ourselves out. We were short circuiting. It was too much. It was like information overload, enlightenment overload. And what happens in any of those situations is apparently that we may make it into the enlightened realms, but you'll in the enlightened realms be kind of like a disabled person. Right. You know, as yes. what she was saying, because you you haven't organically come through the layers of like spiral dynamics, like every step is important. And for you yes. to embody each step, internalize it, then move to the next level is really important. But if you kind of cheat your way through all the levels, yeah, then you're kind of like handicapped when you get to that enlightened stage is what they're saying. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Okay. Yeah, cool. I agree. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, so that's why I'm more natural about it. I'm like, sure, you can try your computer thing, but I don't think you're going to want to do it that yeah, way. Yeah, you just have an overdeveloped orange. <laughs> right. Oh, Hyper, there you go. Hyperdeveloped yeah. orange. Yeah. Well, this is good that we're, we're resonating in all this because you're right. I think these are unmutable topics. They're, it's kind of a no brainer that this is, I mean, there, there's obviously companies working on this right now. We just, yeah, don't, sure. we don't know how far they've gotten with it, but. It's obviously something that's going to happen. I've been daydreaming about, uh uh-oh, my phone, my, oh, deja vu. Yeah, right. (laughs) The glitch in the matrix. (laughs) Do you see a cat running by? (laughs) (laughs) Somebody on Facebook the other day, it said, what? How how did Bill Murray get out of Groundhog Day in the end? Good question. I don't even remember. I didn't remember either. But then somebody replied, he found compassion for others and forgot about his own needs. And Oh, you cut out for a sec. You said he had compassion for others and forgot about his own needs. And then you glitched out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> basically that's it. He cool. he found in but in, Buddha, in Buddhism when you talk about bodhicitta, yes, just like the motivation to attain enlightenment for others and not for ourselves. Yes, so I basically. Just, he, I just talked yeah. about that today, by the way, on my podcast. Cool. Yes. On what? On the other podcast? Oh, on this same podcast, I just recorded. So every other episode or so is going to be me sharing my own thoughts on all this stuff. And then the next episode will be an interview with a guest. So, oh, okay, nice. yeah. So I interviewed, I, ha- I was like, Oh shoot, I just interviewed a guest. I better do my episode so that I can post yours. <laughs> so you did your, so you did that earlier today, this evening. Yes. Nice. 
Yeah, and I was actually, it's already posted, so you can listen to it if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, and I was, in my first episode, I mentioned Bodhicitta, but I meant Bodhisattva. So oh, okay. I, I realized my mistake when I was re-listening to it, and so today's podcast, when I arrived at that topic again, I'm like, oh, and by the way, I said Bodhicitta when I meant Bodhisattva, and here's the differences. So that's really cool that you just brought that up. But bodhisattva is a, a being that's committed to helping others come to enlightenment. But the bodhicitta is the energy of bringing people to enlightenment, right? Is that the difference? Yeah. Cultivating? I think of it as the motivation. The motivation. For the benefit of others. Beautiful. It's motivation. Oh, brother, I'm so glad you're a bodhisattva. <laughs> Likewise. It's good to have you on the team. Yes. <laughs> we need a we need as big a team as we can get. We've exactly. got an infinite number infinite number of sentient beings out there that that are deluded. <laughs> There's an infinite number of Buddhas also, but still. Wow. That's the more the merrier. Yes, the more the merrier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I was actually just, it's funny we're talking about Glitch in the Matrix because I was just reviewing where we ended yesterday. And um, mm -hmm. before we got cut off, we had been talking about AI and how there was definitely companies working on that. And, and then you said something like, you know, I've been daydreaming about dot, 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 and then you got cut off. Do you remember? No, I don't remember in particular what we were talking about. Okay. Well, we were talking about transcend transhumanism okay and then you had mentioned how there are people that want to you know achieve enlightened states through transhumanism and then we kind of both agreed but we'd both rather do it organically because you're not like a disabled person that way <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> in the enlightened realms did that does that spark anything for you about what you were daydreaming about uh I do remember saying that now, and I don't remember what it was. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that we got cut off, but I was so intrigued. I was like, what, what are you daydreaming about? I would love to get um, a, a little peek into your daydreams. <laughs> yeah. I remember, if it, I remember it was a, a little bit off topic. Okay. And I was a little bit apprehensive to share it, but only slightly. We always come right back to topic. Yeah. Well, how about <laughs> Whatever this? it was. <laughs> Go, yeah if we if you remember it brother let's get back on another podcast and we'll do a, a another one with another topic because there's infinite topics i could talk about with you right right we could even go through spiral dynamics and just talk about each level Ooh. one episode at a time Ooh, or I we love could go it. through my communis the communisphere concept of the, the visual map that i made for visualizing complex systems and communities yes we go through one of those each of those one at a time Ooh, i would love that paul and you know this is starting to make me really giddy because i feel like we're tapping into really important information where i feel like at a time like this this could really help the society that we dream of come to fruition yeah i you do know, too yeah awesome I mean, I'm there's not something... much of a networker. I'm glad that you've got podcasts and more than one podcast. And yes, <laughs> and, you know, and I think you actually would be a really good candidate for the next podcast that's coming out in about six podcasts that I'm working on right now, <laughs> all together. Six <laughs> different podcasts. One of them already has like 40 episodes. That's the Port Portland Neighborhood podcast, wow. which is about getting to know every one of the 95 neighborhoods of Portland. Um, and all the different sustainability things going on, community things going on, features of each neighborhood. So that's really fun. Um, um, that's actually being done for a client who's um, a real estate agent um, offering this as a free gift to the city, but obviously for some PR for both of us. Um, right. But the, so the next one I worked on was the flip, which you could come on that if you want and tell a story of turning a negative situation in your life into a positive. Okay. Um, then the, but the one that I think that would really fit that I'm excited about is um, the Within Reach movie team and I 
are um, going to come out with this new podcast called Redefine Community. All right. And that we're, sounds good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, the goal of it is to two twofold. One, to go back to every single one of the interviews that we did for that movie. And I think there was about 600 as we traveled two years. Wow. Around, around the country on bicycles visiting 100 sustainable communities because I mean I don't really know for a fact how many we did but we not only interviewed multiple people at each of the 100 communities but then on the road we interviewed people that we met along the way at random space places you know we'd have these amazing conversations pull out the camera do an interview on the street you know and so we have to have at least 600 interviews so we're, our goal is to reach out to as many of those past people and ask them to watch their interview from 10 years ago and reflecting on it now, how do they feel about sustainable community now? Wow, yeah, that's great. That would be really insightful for them and probably a lot of fun also. Yeah, and so for you, we didn't get to interview you, but I also wanna bring in guests that we never got to interview and especially people like you who have been thinking about this and experiencing the sustainable community movement for at least 10 years, you've probably been doing it longer than that, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot longer. Oh, that's amazing. See, and then you'd be a perfect candidate to just, you know, join in on the conversation of that show. So if you want to join on that one, we're working, we're working some angles right now to get some of our past people back. But my biggest hurdle has been finding the time and the, and the method to get those interviews watchable for people. Because right yeah. now it's a bunch of mishmashed clips and I have to make sure that I don't send them a clip that's like all, here's six clips all out of order. Try watching your interview because I'll never do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and I'm kind of trying to prioritize who to send them to first. And so we've already made, reached out to a couple people and if they can help us get the momentum going and then you as well, then we got, a, we got another podcast on our hands. <laughs> Did you guys go to Lost Valley? Yes. Actually, do you have any interviews from there? No, because we didn't do it on the journey. I've just okay. passed. I've just passed through there on one of my journeys around Oregon at one point in my life. But yeah, it's an amazing place, isn't it? Yeah, I was thinking about the about Communities Magazine is based there now. Oh, they're in Lost Valley now. Oh, that with Chris yeah. Roth. Chris, yeah, Chris is the editor now. Yes. He wrote an amazing article about Within Reach. Oh, cool. Yeah. And yeah. So we got to connect with him through that. He's a really nice person. Yeah. When yeah. you said prioritize, that's what came to mind. Yeah. Ooh, good point. You know, actually, I think he would actually be a perfect person to interview because in his review of our movie, which was very unbiased and I loved it, he said lots of wonderful things about the movie, but then wanted to give, you know, some you know, Siskel Ebert style feedback, constructive right. critique. And his constructive critique was that the movie was definitely a puff piece for the sustainable communities movement. It wasn't um, a well, kind of like a well-balanced documentary that gives both sides of the story. And uh -huh. I, I appreciated that. And, you know, and he said like, we definitely in that biased perspective of the film that we were making, which was obviously pro sustainable communities, what we left out are two things. One, the perspective of the everyday American who might be like, well, why would I want to go live off the land with a bunch of hippies? <laughs> and yeah. then, you know, and then secondly, we didn't, we did actually give a very rose colored view of the communities movement and didn't really talk about the challenges and the negative aspects of it. And my reasoning for that was that we tried and none of the communities really felt comfortable sharing their dirty laundry yeah with the public nor did it in, even on the individual level people didn't want to out their community or things within the community because then it would make them look bad within the community right and it can cause more friction within the community as if there's not enough already right exactly yeah. and so you know the what we discovered on the journey was um we used we turned the camera back on ourselves mandy and i and yeah. half the if you haven't watched it yet have you have you seen it I haven't seen all of it. It's free. It's free on the, it for some reason. Okay. It's free on the internet now. I can send you the link. Okay. I'll, put it, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I but, remember that was part of the problem. 
okay. I don't have a problem paying for it, but when I went back then, I did. I was, I was living on food stamps alone. So. Oh, I bet that's the story of a lot of people who want to see it too. So thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll put that in the show notes for, within reach is free now. And then it's also going to be on Amazon very soon. Amazon prime. Um, it's being processed right now. So that's exciting. Um, but yeah, I wanted to say that the within reach, um, journey movie was half about our crazy bicycle journey around the country. And then half of it, we highlighted 10 of the 100 sustainable communities and kind of picked a very diverse set of different types of communities. And, uh, uh -huh. um, but the interesting thing was, is that because the communities weren't able to really share their dirty laundry with us, we shared our dirty laundry about ourselves. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see Which... every aspect of me that I'm embarrassed about by these days. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I remember you talking about that. It's like, that is kind of like, in some respect, that's like, from from a reality programming perspective yeah. and, and regular like everyday tv that they have yes since the 90s like yes. that's what made the that's what dropped draws drew people's attention a lot it's like it was the glue that stuck it all together yes in fact i think we made this right around the time of like road rules and um survivor and all those because right, right. it was like 2007 when i started the project and uh -huh. one of one of my friends at the, in sebastopol at the time was like if you really want this movie to take off which at the time we were just planning to do like a youtube series or something she was like you know you should just turn it into like a reality tv show and turn the camera on yourself and we were like oh no 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 <laughs> that's not gonna happen but after she shared that idea with all these friends of ours and they all told us to do it where you had no choice. <laughs> so that's how it ended up becoming kind of like a reality show, which I think it was a great idea. Ultimately, you know, she was yeah, right. I think so. <laughs> but man, that was not something I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, all for the sake of the cause, right? All for the cause. <laughs> The relaunch looking forward to it yes us too so okay so on that note i wanted to say that you have um so much you know manifestation powers paul and constance and i are really working on our manifestation powers too so because i believe in you and your manifestation powers paul i would love to continue this conversation in a way where we could like you said start kind of really in detail talking about what these communities could look like in the future so that we can create it. Right. I kind of have a, a thing where you, you were talking about the rose colored glasses. Yeah. I kind of have a, I want to look at both sides and usually whenever I, I don't usually Oops. just look at the negative. Like okay. a lot of pack back up just a sec you cut out again you were talking about how you don't want to look you want to look at both sides and then i missed you okay i i tend to look at both sides equally and i try to be as unbiased as possible and i try to verbally express that and nice. sometimes the, i was with the startup societies group at a conference the startup societies foundation conference and the people that are doing the the seasteading Oh yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I was talking with some of them and I I I, I was I didn't realize I was gonna get a, a reaction. I thought it was just a question for me, but I said, Well what what do you think makes communities fail? And some people and nobody wanted to talk about that. And I was like, But this is like super important. If we can figure out what what makes communities fail, then we can figure out what makes them succeed. But they just yeah. jump straight into like, we don't do that. We just figure out what makes them succeed. And then I think about wow. Abraham Hicks and things like that. And they're always saying, just focus on what you want, not what on, not on what you don't want. Ooh. So I'm kind of at a toss up because I feel like I know what I want because I looked at what was, what was not working. Right. But then appreciative inquiry also says, focus on what's working. So well, thank you I do like to look up. at both sides. Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing this up. Okay. So this is kind of um, 
what they were talking about on the cosmic um what did i call it the other night the po- cosmic matrix podcast yeah. yeah they were talking about how we as new agers tend to you know sweep things under the rug basically and don't right. want to talk about the negative and so you know you become this benign human because you can't really touch upon the negative but then it also makes you a really fragile person so they were talking about this new concept of being anti-fragile right and um it really moved me because what you're talking about is for me i you know and this is good you t- you study buddhism too so i stayed in a monastery during the within reach journey for about six months and jugni the monk who's who's now colin aren't he he withdrew his vows and became a lay person since then um but we've always talked about this concept he shared with me that deeply moved me about imagine the positive for sure and what you really want but please acknowledge the worst case scenario and then let it go and right and what that does is when you at least acknowledge the worst case scenario then you don't have this built up resistance to it that creates blocks and then actually attracts energy right Right? yeah so like if you are constantly thinking um i want that house i want that house i want that house but then you're worried about inside deep down like i don't know how i'm gonna get the money for that i don't know how i'm gonna get the money for that you're creating a block because you're actually thinking about i don't know how i'm gonna get the money so he said you know just think okay i want that house but it's very likely the worst case scenario is I just will never have the money for that. And then you can, and you can just kind of let that go. And then from there you can kind of work on, okay, between those two energies, where do I go? And usually it moves you to action and that action helps you achieve your goal anyways, you know? And so I kind of yeah, like yeah. that approach. It's a more proactive, realistic, grounded approach. Yeah. I like that too. So on that note, are you a fan of manifesting like the kind of communities that we want to see? Or are you more of a fan of like first kind of looking at what went wrong, then moving forward from there? I seem to, it it seems to me that whenever I work with community groups, their conditioning from birth into a patriarchal Mm perspective it's like fish don't know they're wet i want to point out the water i want everybody to see what we're swimming in here right so that we can decide if we want wings instead Ooh, paul but it's really hard because nobody can see the water because they're fish yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i i made a special like intention to like really understand what the hell's going on and what we're doing what in the very early days when I, like, I was, t- 20 years ago, I started living in communities. And then in 2006, maybe, or 2005, somebody said, handed me a book, that book by Diane Christian Leaf. Yes, Diana Christian Leaf, um, Creating Community. And then there's another one, Finding Community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it was Creating a Community. That yes. He handed uh, those me are, like, for me, like, the Bibles of sustainable community or intentional community, really. And then he said, what do you want to create that you did not already have? And I was not able to answer the question. So then I dove into answering that question. And now I ask everyone that question in community, and sometimes they get mad (laughs) because they they just don't know. (laughs) They think they have such a clear vision, and then you ask that question, and they're like, I don't know. Like we want to create cob houses, but we already have cob houses. Let's go buy one of those if that's what we want to create. <laughs> oh well, what is it we want to create that we don't already have? That's beautiful. And when you say don't already have, do you mean don't already have personally, or don't already have as a community or as a world? Kind of like we complain about the world. Uh, We'll talk about capitalism. We'll talk about Donald Trump. We we want somebody to blame, but if if we were in charge, what would we be doing differently? And it doesn't have to. It seems like it's such a daunting question because of the complexity. Yeah. 
And if I just were to spill the beans, there's no way anybody can do anything without a place to stand and breathe. Mm. And if that place to stand and breathe is controlled by others, then we're going to see problems. Right. I love that. That is seriously in line with what I love about the Anastasia books. Yeah. Where she talks about the plot of land. Like everybody needs to have their own plot of land that they have dominion over. Right. Right. That I like your yeah. lines with what you said about having a place to breathe that nobody has control over you. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And the reason that I say a stand and breathe is because some people are like, well, you don't really need land because you can make money. You don't need to make money off the land. Not everybody's going to grow carrots. Some people are going to code oh. software. So they just need a computer, but they still need a place to stand and breathe. Yeah. Even if we uploaded our conscious, until we upload our consciousness to computers, we're always going to need land. <laughs> yes. Yes. Interesting. And then also, I people will, people sometimes I'll, if I talk about Henry George like I did in the in the beginning of this podcast yeah his idea is that somebody can own the land but the value is what they own and then the people that live there have decision making power but yeah. everybody has to pay rent and a lot of people are like well I don't want to pay rent I thought that's what we're trying to get away from but if the rent is used as a taxation then it can continually raise the property value and the quality of life. And if you don't have everyone paying rent and everyone just lives for free, the quality of life goes down. And we see that in, in Indian reservations, for example. Wow. Or even like Hawaiian homelands. People don't have any incentive to improve their quality of life. Interesting. But if they were forced to pay rent for their own benefit, then every month they would be able to put a new roof on the house or whatever. Yeah. Every month the money would accumulate to where they could raise the quality of life by interesting. Improving. Beautiful. I think that's what we want to create that we don't already have, but it's really difficult to have a conversation because yeah. people are like, why would I pay rent on my own land? That just doesn't make sense. Beautiful. So what a thought. It kind of does. So what are your thoughts on, you know, I think that it's, it's time for people to start looking at um, the shadow side within this sustainable communities movement and, um, you know, also intentional communities is another way to phrase that, sorry. Um, but we kind of tried to coin the term sustainable communities for our project because we wanted to kind of niche out in the communities world and, you know, because in the intentional communities, you've got strictly spiritual communities or you've got strictly uh i don't know there's just all kinds of different communities it's paul you want to say hi to paul hi <laughs> <laughs> we've been just geeking out about communities for two days now <laughs> and we could just go on forever he's great <laughs> yeah good, we good. <laughs> there she is there's some light on the love <laughs> <laughs> good to see you good to see you too <laughs> yay. yay and then there's another podcast that we're working on that's the sixth one it's Constance's podcast she's doing love relationships how to find your soulmate nice yes um, okay so back to yeah so there's this whole shadow thing like um, where was I going with that Paul um there was a comment i love um you know we did we did get a few little hints at people talking about the struggles within the communities movement the sustainable communities movement um at one of the eco villages we visited in within reach that made it in the movie was called um um burlington co-housing it's in vermont near burlington is it cob hill it's cob Cobb, Cobb Hill? Anyways, it's in Vermont. It's a co-housing community, but they also have a farm on the land, which is very rare 
for, for co-housing communities to have a full blown farm, working farm on the land and a community, a co-housing community that's in a remote rural location, but looks like a modern, you know, very modern in the city style co-housing, which is more like condominiums, you know? So this place was really unique. Um, yeah, Cobb Hill, Heartland, Vermont. That's what it is. Um, and they also have a third tier to that place, which is a sustainability research think tank institute on the property. Uh, right. All based on the fact that the owner or the founder of the whole idea was a professor at a college in Vermont. And so this university kind of, or this uh, think tank on the farm kind of became an uh, like an annex of the university, I think. And the, the oh, whole no. property became kind of a research, I don't know, I would think like a social laboratory experiment. And one of the guys on the property, Phil, um, gosh, I can't remember his last name right now. Phil, anyways, he's um, a beautiful, soft thinker, or soft man, just jo so gentle. And you could tell he's just really grounded. Reminds me of you, honestly, in a lot of ways. Um, and he'd been working with this institute on the ideas of community, sustainability, um, all kinds of stuff. But then the one thing that he brought to the table as, a, as part of their research was what the problem is with sustainable communities. And his perspective that he'd seen through his research was that you don't have in America the confinement that you would have in a place like Tibet in the in the deep into the Himalayan mountains where you have this small little village of however many people that if you don't get along with the people there and you want to leave you have nowhere to go you're not going to be hiking out of the Himalayas on your own and trying to live somewhere else in the Himalayas like that's just not going to happen yeah. you need each other and right. it's, it kind of reminds me of back in the Native American days, it was like, if you were kicked out of a tribe, you were basically given a death sentence, you know, like you it needed each of. other, right? <clears throat> and the problem with our culture is that we don't need each other. If you don't get along with someone, you can just leave. Or if you live in a big city, right. you can just probably never see them again. Right, and, right. And so since we have this out, we've, he believes that's the biggest problem that we've created within our culture. There's right. no, there's no permanent glue <laughs> and he feels like the glue in those cultures is just the confinement and the, the restriction. Right. It kind of be, can be problematic. And two things I thought of one was yeah. that's, that's why Hakeem Bey in his book, Taz, the temporary autonomous zone. Yeah. That's why he says the community should always be temporary. And he says that Beautiful. a, a, a temporary autonomous zone can even be like a potluck dinner. Everybody comes, it. they talk, and then they disperse. So it. communities are built and put together, and then maybe a year later, they fall apart. And it's important because that's how we learn. I love it. Just getting stuck in a situation. But also I thought of this perspective about how the ancient, more ancient communities would be stuck together. They haven't evolved through the different spiral levels like we have so we evolved through the orange to the green but in tibet they're still at blue and purple even oh purple wow blue. so it's easier for them to stick together because they don't have that that individualist freedom that we do that we developed at right. orange like our grandparents did. right so we need to continue to accommodate space for that individual freedom but yet st somehow find uh, like an ability to stick it through the hard times <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or just be able to express ourselves at all levels in a healthy way. Yeah. So that conflict doesn't arise in the first place. Yeah. That reminds me of Scott Peck, that, the author of the, what is it, the Community Drum? Or... Okay, I haven't read that one. Do you know who Scott Peck is, though? I don't think so, no. Oh, I'm going to write that down. Show notes. Hey. Scott, Scott Peck is amazing. Um, his books have inspired um, actually many um, community type groups from men's groups to forming community groups to all kinds of um, efforts towards forming community with the basis of getting to know each other first and working through actually kind of like a in the same vein I'm sure spiral dynamics influenced him 
Um, but in the vein of like, there's an evolutionary journey in the re- in a relationship of a community. And, um, you know, you're in the, initially in the honeymoon phase and then you start, um, you know, talking about things that are uh, of real substance. And then you're definitely going to have a, a phase where you hit a wall and you're going to want to leave. And then, and so in his practice that he, these, these journey practices that you give to these community groups that are forming, which I've actually been through, one of the phases is, I can't remember the specific name he labeled it, but it's like a pushing through that hump of wanting to leave and the pain of that initial conflict. And so he actually creates these exercises that kind of creates that within a group situation where you don't even have to be on the land building any, you could just be in somebody's living room meeting once a week, forming community and, you know, being aware that there's these phases and you can literally, and I've done this before with a group in Sebastopol and at like week three or four, you just, you hit that wall and it's like, whoa. And we made it to like eight or 12 weeks or something. And at that point of like pushing through the hump, there's some other phases, but then, but the ultimate result is that you've kind of like have found that glue that you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I love that idea. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. It's great that he has like exercises. Yeah. I think it's called the community drum. Let me look that up real quick while we're talking here. Um, Yeah. His work's amazing. The director of sustainability at MIT, his name is Jason Jay. And I met him on Kauai and he and another guy had written a book that's similar, but they're coming from an academic perspective because they're at MIT. Okay. (laughs) That's oh, what wow. people there do, apparently. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but they call it tension. Where they, you, it's a, like a lot of people try to escape the tension, and they're saying, no, this is what we need. That's where the insight and the innovation comes from. I bet you Whether that's what he calls it, too, yeah. Detentions phase. Okay, nice. It's, so we're developing a common language. Yeah, this is great. I love that. Uh, M, M. Scott Peck is his name, and, and the community uh, – wait. Sorry, I had it here. The different drum, and it's called community making and peace. The a spiritual journey towards self acceptance, true belonging, and new hope for the world. I mean, that says it all right there. Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. The genesis of community crisis and community. I mean, these chapters are amazing. Dynamics of community, patterns of group behavior community maintenance, human nature. I mean, this is all patterns of transformation. It's kind of all that stuff that we've been talking about. <laughs> what's, the, what's the title again? It's called, I'll put it in the show notes, but it's called The Different Drum, Community Making oh, and Peace. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. M. Scott Peck. Yeah, I bet you'll love it. So we've, I've got, I actually wrote, um, I, will, I listened to our previous discussion yesterday, um, today, and I took notes. And there's a bazillion links. I, your, your podcast is beyond anything I've ever created as far as the show notes go. <laughs> so many resources for people here. Um, and now today I've even got more. So this, these show notes are going to be off the hook. Awesome. So I'll get to <laughs> put that together tonight. And uh, man, I, I, Paul, I feel like I'm, I'm honored and lucky and blessed to get to talk to you and i think that that you are an asset to this movement and the world in so many ways thank you yeah i'm glad to be plugging in a little bit yay yeah you most of the time i'm just drifting and (laughs) (laughs) enjoying learning more you know you're this you're the quiet you you remind me of the the monks in the mountains of tibet that are just these amazing people and they don't really interact with the world, but what they do do is they hold space for the world. And you know, they're, they're creating this energy vibe that is emanating all throughout the world with their prayers. And I think that you're that kind of a person. You're just holding space for us all. But man, it's nice to interact with you. <laughs> I've been trying to renunciate my renunciation for like five <laughs> years now. But, uh, I think I'm starting to have a one foot on either side. <laughs> I'm I'm so with you. This is this is very shocking to me that I've I'm now got my hands in six podcasts. Um, yeah, yeah. 
I don't know how it happened. It's just kind of all like within the past few months, it's all kind of happened. I'm like, wow. I was, I was just living this boring life as a papa and a, and a, <laughs> a husband in Portland running a video business. And all of a sudden I'm back into these like important topics again. I'm like, Fun. I don't know who I am to share all this, but you know, thank you for pointing out yesterday. You really impacted me that my, I think my job right now is to bring people like you on and just listen and reflect. Uh huh. And like I said, you're a great networker. Oh, thank and you. I've told you you're a great listener many times over the years. Thank you. Well, I, I really, I feel like I pick, I pick people who I see something in. I have this, like this kind of this intuition about people. And when I see that they're sacred rebels and they have something special <laughs> to share, I'm listening. I am all ears. <laughs> and did you contact Alona and yes. someone else yesterday? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, Alana um, and I talked for a while and then she introduced me to Dennis Shep, who also bought some right. land. And then Constance the was remembering that you had talked to us about this when you were here visiting in Portland like a year ago. So she's got a great memory, by the way. Um, so I think she said, I think Paul told us about the girl who was buying land in Spain or something or bought a village. I feel like I remember that. So this is all coming full circle, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she and bought I, land in California too. That's right. She mentioned that last night. It was in Point Arena is what she said. Yeah. And yeah. there I've been. It's a, it's a beautiful land. There's no no uh, infrastructure at all, but it's wow, pretty amazing. That's cool. And is, is that project still happening? Yes. Cool. She, she saved said, the land. She told me. Oh, so so she's wow. She's a busy person. She's working yeah. on that project in NorCal, and she's working on this project in Spain too. Yeah. Wow. She grew up in Russia. Wow. She told me. Her parents were academics, scientists. Wow. And Russia fell apart in 1989. She was born in 1992, grew up in po poverty, but then the, got into entrepreneurism and, and turned out where she could now buy some land. <laughs> That's amazing. She's, she was born in 92. That makes me feel old and unaccomplished. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was born in 76. Man, she's, she's like, let's see, 2002, 2012. She's, she's only 28 about, or something. Yeah, 28. Oh, my God. Such an accomplished <laughs> person for so young. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anything about Dennis, except that he's got a kind of similar situation in Spain where he's bought some village. Do you know anything more about him? No, I just talked to him yesterday also for the first time. Is that but because I mentioned that she mentioned it and then you mentioned or something? <laughs> she mentioned him to me and then I mentioned you to him. And he's, I actually, I mentioned a podcast. Would you be interested in being on a podcast? And he cool. said, you mean Ryan's podcast? I was like, yeah, I guess <laughs> Alona had also told you about him. That's perfect. Oh man. I love how, how this word of mouth is just happening so fast. It's great. Yeah. So what, what did he say? Did he say yes or no? <laughs> Uh, I just, I just dropped the conversation there because I thought you guys were gonna work that out. So I yeah, we like, will. Oh, we okay, will. That's the one. Great. He was so sweet though. He was like, at first he was like, "Who's this?" And I was like, "Hi there, Alana and Paul Brooks mentioned your villages in Spain." And he's like, "Oh, cool. Okay." So I sent him the broadcast, and he's like, "Oh, cool. I'll take a look." And um, I just kind of slightly mentioned like, "Do you want to be interviewed?" <laughs> he hasn't responded yet, <laughs> so we'll see. Uh -huh. But um, I'm excited to send both him and Alona your interview because I think that'll get them geeked out. I think your interview is going to geek a lot of people out, honestly. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for starting something. Yeah. It's probably good. I can go in so many different directions to like tighten them up sometimes and <laughs> keep good boundaries so we don't go all over the place but yeah that's true i am totally guilty of going on tangents but i have to say i'm also really good at bringing them full circle you so are, you just, are. just know that about me but yeah if you want to draw boundaries i'm all about that 
Yeah. Keep me on track, I sir. Was, <laughs> I was I was thinking another great topic would be matriarchy Ooh. because people don't realize that there's a political matriarchy mm. that it's female dominance, which is actually patriarchy, just the same. Yes. But then from an anthropological perspective, there's there's a partnership cultures that have existed and those are true matriarchies. Okay. And they're the opposite of patriarchy, not the same. Ooh, I would love to talk about that. Constance and I did a podcast together for her relationship work um, about a week ago. And it was called Balancing the Inner Masculine and the Inner Feminine. Uh -huh. And um, pa patriarchy, matriarchy came up in that discussion, but I'd never heard about this. What I had mentioned, and tell me if this is similar, I had mentioned that there are native cultures. Well, first of all, we mentioned that when we have a patriarchy and we want to move away from it, we don't want to move to a matriarchy in the sense that you're replacing the male power dynamic with just a female power dynamic. Yes. Is that what kind of what you're feeling too? Yeah. Cause that would still be patriarchy with women in charge. Exactly. Okay. I like the way you put that. I wouldn't <laughs> have worded it that way, but that makes total sense. Yes. Okay. So, and then on the, on the flip side though, um, I mean, yes, we want to be moving towards a balanced masculine and feminine culture, society. Um, but it's interesting that there's another way that has been done in the past. And I'm going to refer to native cultures. So maybe this is lower on the spiral dynamics evolutionary track. Really? But I think there is one thing that I appreciated about some native cultures where they have the, um, the elder females in the inner circle. Uh -huh. And they speak. And the outer circle is the males and they don't speak, but they hold space for the women. So they're kind of creating like this support system. Like we're here, we support you, but you speak, you make the arguments and decisions. And I think I could be wrong, but I think the men can speak up if they're asked uh -huh. or something like There's that. There's probably, anyway. probably two modes of decision-making too. Like the, the internal household decisions okay. or the tribal within the little village decisions yeah. yeah and then the delegation between tribes and nations yeah which the men would do so yeah. the women would hold space for the men in that scenario yeah. i'm just assuming from what i've yeah. read i don't know like specifically to what you're talking about but. yeah well i haven't looked into it too deeply but i i just heard that that has existed in the past and my thought on that is, well, that sounds more like a matriarchy, but yet in a more balanced way than just being kind of like patriarchy, but taking power as women. I don't know. Yeah. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I think that the way that people instituted matriarchy in the past is that the women had the, the land and property was passed down to the women. Oh, wow. So they had control over the property but the men made the decisions on the grand scale. Mm. So the women were protected by the men making these big decisions between nations so that the wars didn't break out. And the men were protected because they had a place to stay. But if the men made some decisions that the women weren't down with, the women were going to be like, we own the land. How about you to sleep? How about so, you leave? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was kind of like a checks wow. and balances there because nobody wow. had absolute control. But now in our patriarchal society, a woman can buy land and it, she can make anyone leave at any time because she has full decision-making power and full control over the land. Right. She has both. There's no checks and balances. Right. Well, that's another whole discussion for a podcast. I love it. And maybe that's one we could also include Constance on because she seems yeah. to be interested in that topic too. Yeah, yeah. And her insight and uh, inquiries would be really helpful. for Aww. As a woman, especially yeah, one that is really interested in loving relationships, which community is yeah. all about. <laughs> that's great. Well, Paul, I want to just keep talking forever and ever, but I think we have surpassed almost three hours or we're getting close <laughs> to the three hour mark for this. So this will be by far my longest episode ever. I hope uh, it's engaging. I think it will be, but we better cut it off here and create a part two. Okay. okay. <laughs> right, right. Next time. <laughs> yeah.
thank you for having me. This has been really fun. Yeah, you're you're a blessing, Paul. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Well, any final thoughts and we can sign off. Uh nothing in particular. How can people contact you or do you not want them to? <laughs> uh, uh, I just took down two websites okay. and, and and took them all apart and I'm put them back together as three websites. Cool. So I can let you know when, when they're, they're up right now. They're just like, they're not finished. I'm not okay. ready for that. So soon I'll have those up and I can share those. Okay. Is there a, um, maybe a profile on social media they can check you out at? Right, right. That's a good idea. Uh, just anybody can Google me at Paul Dion Brooks. One word or three words. Either Paul way, I Beyond think. Brooks. Like beyond sight or whatever. No, no, no. Uh, Paul Dion, like Dion Warwick or Dion Sanders. Oh, Dion. How do you spell that? D-I-O-N. D-I-O-N. Okay, thank you. Paul Paul Dion Brooks. Okay, and then you said to Google, have just people Google that? Yeah, and they'll find my Facebook, my Instagram, my Medium. I will do a Bitly link for people. So I'll I'll do the Google search, grab that okay. Google URL for y'all, and then put in the little Bitly link so you can just click on it and find Paul. Yes. Super. Okay, cool. Awesome, man. Hey, let's do this again, please. You yeah, you nice. really lift me up, man. You give me hope. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I I appreciate having um, thinkers like you on this planet because I think it's thinkers like you that give me hope that there's practicalities that can happen in the very near future. Very near. Very near. Yes. <laughs> See you Sorry, again brother. soon. Very near. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> I see you like. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Paul. <laughs>